mood altering drugs which are supposed to keep me level leaded which clearly I am not at this stage Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome on the Sunset Safari here with Wild Earth. You are watching Safari Live, that's what the show is called. And at the moment you're looking at a serrated hinged terrapin, a little baby serrated hinged terrapin. It is sitting in a pan full of hippo dung, uh, buffalo dung and indeed a two buffalo and one hippopotamus. My name is James Hendry, on camera today we've got Andrew dressed in a black shirt. That's a particularly silly idea because the sun is out, it's 33 degrees centigrade and 91 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually not too unpleasantly hot, it's quite muggy, mm, a feeling of moisture in the air. I don't think there's going to be any rain. There's no rain predicted, not even in the next seven days. So the drought continues as it has for a while. You are live with us. So please do talk to us. Andrew, there's another serrated hinged terrapin climbing onto the back of the hippopotamus. Astonishing scenes here at the Juma Dam Pan. So as I was saying, you are live. Please do talk to us, ask us questions, send us your comments. Tell us how a drought in Africa makes you feel because I know it makes a lot of people feel quite sad. It makes them feel quite um, nervous about what's going to come in the future. So tell us how you feel about that. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv if you happen to be on the email. Then the other thing I need to tell you is that the, on the other vehicle is Jamie and she is being filmed, of course, by the enormous Brian Joubert. They are heading down to the south to see if they can find tracks of either Tingana or Karula who were seen around that area this morning. In the final control, we've got Kirsty on vocals and uh, Jere on the keys. Now, the one thing that I do need to say to you further to our, or just before we kind of get on with things today, is regarding Karula, it is just slightly worrying to me that her den site was so close to where the hyena den is. And to have seen the amount of hyena and wild dog activity around the place that there has been in the last few days does make me slightly nervous. We, we won't know for sure for a while. We certainly haven't been into the area to check on the cubs yet. We did make a perfunctory sort of search through there the other day. We didn't see anything, but of course you don't go and stick your head into the den. So we don't know what's happening with her cubs yet. She did look like she was suckling yesterday, so that is good news. But at the moment, we're gonna leave her be and just let her carry on as, as is. If we bump her on the roads like we did yesterday, we found her here, and then Taxon found her at Buffleshook Dam then we'll view her, but we're not going to be following her off-road precisely as we didn't do yesterday. So that's the update on Karula. Tingana, well, he headed off down sort of in the direction that she did yesterday evening, and he was found on the southern end of the Mlilwati drainage line, Mlilwati drainage line, uh, to the south of the reserve, and he crossed south into Little Gauri, which is a property to the south of us. Right. I don't think we're going to spend too much more time here. Interesting three buffalo or four buffalo. And our next port of call is going to be the Gallagher waterhole, followed by Arethusa. While we're on our way to the next waterhole, let's head across to Jamie. She can give you an update for herself, and I will see you shortly. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our <laughs> sunset safari. On a blistering hot day, it's even too hot for the monkeys to be up to their usual mischief. She's clutching onto the tree to try and cool herself down, <laughs> clinging onto the little one at the same time. And as I said, it really is a boiling hot afternoon, and most of the animals appear this afternoon to have adopted a nap in the shade approach, which is certainly sounds to me like a rather promising plan. I don't know. But welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie, and I have Brian on camera with me this afternoon. And what a lovely way to start, but with this female and her youngster. 
taking you onto the branch. Mom is now fast asleep. Baby's still watching with curious bright eyes and looking at, out across us. What's up, little one? Are you bored? Nap time over. Hello, mischief. <laughs> Mom could not be less interested. And this is the perfect place for a monkey to seek refuge, a nice thick jackalberry tree. Plenty of shade for them. And a little bit of cool air. Rather than lying close to the ground, they can be safe and secure up there. They're hidden from something like martial eagles, which would definitely have a go at a monkey. And even the smaller raptor species would target that little one. So they found safe refuge. And with a little bit of the breeze that's blowing, a nice cool spot. A bit further up and to the right, there's another monkey who is lying, has adopted a leopard pose on the jackalberry. Legs splayed on either side, tail draped down in a way that we've seen countless leopard sightings begin and end, wrapped comfortably around a tree. And maybe all of that lichen that you can see giving that bark a pale color. Maybe that also acts to cushion the bark and make it feel a little bit less rough. Most likely two females napping. I'm not sure where the rest of the troop is. <sighs> little, little baby. I think a little bit bored with the idea of nap time. Much like a toddler when its parents are trying to sleep. But unlike a toddler, is sensible enough to know that this is the safest spot for it to be. The monkey's very seldom going to go venturing off and explore all by itself. What do you think, little one? <laughs> Mom completely exhausted. It's amazing how comfortable they feel to be able to sleep like that. I mean, that really doesn't look like the most secure pose that a monkey could adopt. Maybe she's got more of a ledge there than I realize. Maybe he's going to have a tentative nibble. Oh, you've woken mom up now, little one. Oh! <laughs> Board you on. <laughs> you can just see it. It is so like a human child that wants to get up to mischief but doesn't quite know where to start. There we go, there we have our answer to that. Which is to have a solid nibble. Oh, and a scratch. And of course, just like all other animals, they carry ticks and fleas and parasites. Probably less so, because they've got those dexterous fingers to pull them out, just like this one's doing. Already knows how exactly how to go about removing irritating parasites. Did you get it? <laughs> Mom now having a go, scratching through her fur. And of course. The monkey's hands are one of the most fascinating. Oops, she definitely got one that time. There's nothing like having a good groom and supplementing your diet at the same time. Mom, I want attention, Mommy. Actually trying to, quite possibly trying to get to nipples to have a suckle. Mom's not being terribly cooperative. What an awesome monkey sighting. It's not often that we really get to enjoy something like this. This is the second time I've had an incredible monkey sighting on this tree. This troop appears to be a little bit more relaxed than some of the other monkeys around this area. I can't tell if this baby's actually managed to suckle in that position or if it's still trying. <laughs> Look at the way it's trying to twist around to get there. And, of course, 
monkey's mammary glands are situated between their front legs, which is quite unusual out here. Most animals' nipples are situated between their back legs. It's only really the primates and then elephants that are the exception to that rule. <laughs> oh, ooh, 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 chastised. Shame, little one, I'm not being terribly obliging. Just look at that dexterity, okay? You're gonna go and bug somebody else. <laughs> Using that tail as an extra balancing tool for a little bit of security. I'm just going to climb over the other monkey. Not very respectful of nap time. I'm gonna try again, it's gonna try and suckle again. And mom, I don't think is feeling terribly tolerant of it. Already at this young age, and I would guess at a couple of, probably about two or three months, this little monkey will be not fully weaned, but on the way to being weaned and eating solid food as well. It's still, still feeding on the milk. managed to get its afternoon snack after all. After nap time comes milk time for afternoon tea. And draped across uh, uh, all three of them are those wonderfully long tails. And Trudy was wondering, do they use them when jumping from tree to tree? And yes, they've got the most incredible degree of control, even more so than something like a leopard or a lion, which is which also use their tails for balance and for counterbalance and steering. Monkeys have the additional ability of being their, their tails being quite prehensile. So they can stiffen them at will when they jump to counterbalance. And then of course, once they land, use them as an additional limb to wrap around the tree branches. As to how much of that is voluntary control versus involuntary, I honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I always notice with, particularly with cats and dogs, that degree of conscious control over their tails seems to be lacking. But primates, of course, could be a completely different story. And Jeannie, absolutely. Jeannie was wondering if a monkey is born with a long tail. And yes, they're born like not quite perfect miniatures of the adults, but they definitely have all of the requisite parts. And possibly even those tails look slightly longer because little monkeys always look so incredibly skinny. Now, Jeannie, I don't know if you were watching that sighting that we had at Galago Pan with the baby monkey that was playing with the other monkeys of the troop. But even then, it's at a, it was only a couple of weeks old and still fairly bald. It was that young. And even then, it had the control over its tail and was using it and actually playing with it at one point. And I imagine that little baby monkeys' tails are a little bit like baby elephants' trunks. Not necessarily automatically know exactly how to use them. She's managed to pacify her youngster. And Sharon, that bond between mother and baby is incredibly powerful in primates in particular, as it is with all animals. But Sharon was wondering how many babies do they have at a time? And the answer is one. For 99% of the time, they will have one youngster. There are recorded cases of twins, but obviously having one baby with the amount of parental care that monkeys invest within their youngsters and their offspring makes sense to be able to devote your resources to only having one youngster particularly with an extended lactation period. It's not like, for example, leopards or lions that don't lactate for all that long in comparison. It's useful then in that situation, they have multiple youngsters and are not with the youngsters the entire time. So they've got very, very high mortality rates. Whereas with baby monkeys, the care is constantly given. They travel with the troop, tucked around their mother's bellies 
some of you may have seen monkeys being carried in that way and it's incredible that they have that instinct to cling on to their mothers even at such a young age now, i know that the little one is hidden and that the mother's face is hidden well the reason that i haven't repositioned to try and get a better view is i actually think it would disturb them the only way in which i could do that is to inch closer and i don't really want to do that because they just seem so at peace such tranquil creatures now, many of our regulars will recognize the view many of you will recognize the area that we're in we're at twin dams and this is where the wild dogs disappeared this morning and the reason i'm here is first of all to check that the wild dogs didn't cross back towards this side of juma sometime just before it got really really hot i think at this point any and all self-respecting predators except for maybe leopards will be resting up in the shade leopards of course like to move about they're surprising creatures they like to move about at all times of the day now that is why i'm here as well is to double check because this morning there were tracks for both tingana and karula crossing out south into Little Gowrie. And I wanted to just see if maybe the presence of the wild dogs to the south of our boundary might have pushed them back towards us. I've checked the southern boundary, no sign of tracks. And so I think we're gonna carry on and see what else we can find. My next plan is to go to Sydney's Dam and see if we can find you some elephants. One last look at our really peaceful and sleepy monkey family, just to see if they decide to do anything, but I don't think they're going to. Stunning sighting. It always pays to have a long watch of special sightings like this. It's easy to overlook the little animals, but they come with their own distinct, fascinating social dynamics and characters. Okay, little monkeys, time for us to move on. I uh, hear tell that poor old James on Rusty and Andrew have met with something of a problem in that Rusty's aerial just came off. I hope you're being observant this afternoon, everybody. You've got to keep your eyes peeled on this show. You'll never know when you might miss something. But yes, poor old Rusty has lost an aerial. So James and Andrew will be frantically repairing that along with Eugene. And of course, it's quite, um, our aerial's quite essential to the work that we do. It's one of those interesting things that I had to learn about was driving around and keeping the aerial secure. And I, I mean, I would, I'm not actually surprised that something rattled off. This morning was absolutely frantic in terms of pacing. There was a lot of very rapid driving and some off-roading. And at that point, I think maybe it just proved to be a little bit too much for poor old Rusty's aerial. Oh, it's nice to drive. It gives us a nice cool breeze. And as we travel down the drainage line, mainly searching for breezes and some shade just enjoying the incredible peace and it's actually almost an oppressive silence at the moment with the heat or the temperatures what they are but in the morning and the evenings we get the cacophony of African bush sounds and Darlene who is one of our regular viewers watching in New Hampshire Darlene would like to know what would be our favorite bush sound and maybe favorite bush smell as well trying to think Darlene um, it's such a difficult one there's so many amazing I think I really enjoy the Chagras calls Chagras are little birds that you might see here and they, there's two of them my favorite is the black crown Chagra which makes a sort of a oh my lips are a little bit dry this might be a bit tricky Jamie's animal imitations coming out as famous as they are for being absolutely terrible no, it's not going to work. There's no whistles coming out today. Sorry, Darlene. Then, one of my other favorite sounds is the vocalizations that we heard from wild dogs today. And that was absolutely incredible. This morning, the adults were calling to the pups, making that phenomenal... Ooh, ooh. It's a 
ghostly sound. That's one of my favorite sounds. And then baby rhino squealing. And actually baby rhino is one of, or rhino is one of my favorite smells as well. Black rhino dung in particular. I know this sounds weird. You'll have to take my word for it. I'm trying to sneak up on this pregnant giraffe that we saw the other afternoon. She's very, she, she's very, very shy. I've noticed that she's uncomfortable with the vehicles. This dark colored female who also happens to be very pregnant. Darlene, I haven't finished answering your question, but I'm going to finish once we've chatted a bit about this giraffe. You can see she's a little bit nervous, and I don't know whether that is because she is at close to full-term pregnancy. Often females, when they get to that stage, particularly the general game species tend to get a little bit uncomfortable. But a really beautiful dark colored giraffe. Swishing her tail. I'm not going to try and inch any closer to her. I know that she'll move away from us and she'll move down into the drainage line. You can see it in an animal's body language. As soon as you start to approach, there's just something in the way that they move. It's a combination of their head, their ears, and they get an uncertain swaying from side to side that they do that immediately tells you that they are not comfortable. She might also be a bit stressed out because the smell of wild dogs, which Darlene incidentally is also one of my favorite smells, the smell of wild dogs still permeates the air even after a long afternoon. Maybe because the wind hasn't been blowing that much in this area. She's not looking at us. She's listening to a squirrel alarm calling, which I'm also listening to. I suspect that squirrel is calling in response to the batelier that I saw fly over earlier. But she knows to be alert to the various warning sounds of the animals of the bush particularly if she's going to have a calf. Now, generally, giraffe, as with all of our general game species, will aim to have their babies either sort of towards the morning hours or in the middle of the day, when it's, the day is absolutely at its hottest, and they are able to, or they've got far less chance of a predator stumbling across a new and vulnerable baby. Bye-bye, girl. Don't worry, we're not going to stress you further. just let her disappear. Giraffe, just like monkeys, generally one calf recorded in terms of their birthing process. However, there are recorded cases of twins, but it is not nearly as common as it was once believed to be. It was once believed that giraffe often had twins. And in fact, that is very much the exception to the rule. And I think that all Biologists think that that rumor sort of stemmed from the fact that giraffe quite often leave their babies at an extended distance, much further away than you would expect them to be. And they, they suggest that that's because it's a way of not drawing attention to the baby, so drawing attention away from it. And I'm not quite sure why it is that giraffe adopt that approach where, for example, impala or wildebeest absolutely do not. They've just got a completely different technique. Maybe it's because they're solitary versus herd animals. But either way, it then led to this belief because people would see two young calves of a similar age, and very often mothers with young babies will band together in groups or in herds. They don't have a set herd structure. They're quite relaxed about the individuals that they move around with. And so if one mother was off to the side and not visible to those observing it and they saw two young calves, it led to this belief that giraffe often have twins. And it's not very frequent. It does happen, but it's not at all frequent. Certainly not in the wild in any case. Darlene's actually jumped
Darlene's on board. I was going to finish off ans ans answering Darlene's question by asking her about her favorite sound. Darlene says that her favorite sound is lions roaring, and her favorite smell is the soil after the rain. And I agree with you on both counts. I'm going to give it a little bit more thought and think about my favorite sound. Black-bellied bustards are something that's jumping into my head. Brian, I don't know if you have a favorite. I know. There's so many. Hyena whoops. That contact call is something that is so special. And that low rumble that elephants give off, that sub-frequency, low, deep bass that you feel in your chest when they rumble next to you. I think that's so high up on my list. All right, Darlene, I'm going to give it a little bit of thought while I rack my brains about my favorite sounds and my favorite smells. James's antenna is back on Rusty, and he is up and running, so let's see what he has to say. Right, so we checked the Gallego waterhole. There were some uh, buffalo there. They were doing not very much at all, right? a bit like the ones that were at the Juma Dam camp. So we are now heading towards Arethusa, but we're stopping by Sydney's dam on the way to see if we can't see perhaps a herd of elephants or something like that. Ooh, before we do that, though, there is a very new impala, and it's thummy. Oh, no, it's not that new. It's, it's not as small as I thought it was. I remember we're sitting in the second birthing season now. The little known fact that impala have two birthing seasons. One, they mate in September and they give birth now. And of course, then the major one, they mate in May and they give birth at the end of November. There is a pig, a number of pigs, a sounder of pigs, Andrew. One in the shade, two in the shade. gently ease our way down here. You see them. There we go. Beautiful warthogs. I've been so amazed by how confiding the young warthogs have been this season. Normally, or before the season, I found that the warthog sounders would normally just run away and we'd hardly see anything of them. And then when they gave birth during the, well, what was the sort of beginning of the wet season, suddenly the sows and their youngsters would happily stand and let us film them, and it's wonderful. I think they're secretly the favorite animal of many, many people. And I know Tara Dales, who of course used to direct for us, I know that she used to absolutely love them, even if the other presenter was watching wild dogs killing an elephant. If you found warthogs, she would immediately crash, cut to you, and you would have a warthog sighting. And the fact that they're part of what people nefariously term the ugly five, I think is very unfair. And as I'm sure you've heard before, Warthogs are not good in the drought time. They can't move to water. They're a little bit like me in that they have short legs and they're unable to go huge distances. And so this one, luckily, is sitting around Sydney's dam. And I believe you saw a sounder consisting of a sow and two piglets this morning. And perhaps these are the same ones because they're quite close to Sydney's dam. So they're in prime position. The disadvantage of being around water, of course, if you live around it permanently, is that the predators become very wise to your movements quite quickly. And certainly lions will focus their attentions on water holes when they go hunting. And so if you're a warthog and you live near water, you'd best watch out because a warthog piglet like that is a delicious snack for a lion and a leopard, but a leopard will think twice with the sow there. Now just to the left of the warthog there, Andrew, you will see an antelope, you see him there. I didn't see him for a while, but there's an impala lying on the ground there. A good-looking ram. He's chewing his cud in a little bit of shade that he's found underneath that gory tree, next to some elephant damage. He looks quite imperious, doesn't he? He's a rather good-looking fellow. 
of a multi-species conglomeration. Oh, here comes this cow. She's in full charge, everybody. She's not really charging us. Miss Lynn, you want to know if the animals out here ever encounter troubles giving birth. Miss Lynn, I'm sure they do. Again, like with many defects, though, so let's liken it to human beings. Of course, human beings have untold trouble giving birth, half because of our design and half because of medical science. Medical science, of course, has made it possible for breech births and all sorts of other difficulties, whereas out here, that is not the case. Now, I think what you'll find is that there probably is a genetic element to a breech birth where, you know, if a woman or an animal is predisposed to it, so her offspring will be too. Now, in the animal kingdom, of course, where there isn't medical care, those genes would be bred out of the population, with the result that abnormalities during the birthing process would be much reduced compared with in human beings. That said, I'm very sure, and we've certainly seen it with buffalo, I've seen it with buffalo, breech births do occur. And then, of course, out here, without any kind of medical attention, death is a swift oncomer, especially if the female becomes damaged or is, you know, immobilized by the birth difficulties, she'll become immediately a target for predators like lions. This is wonderful. They're just totally relaxed around us, coming to say hello, eating the last rhizomes. The rhizomes, of course, are the underground sort of storage root cells that the grass plants have. It's like an underground stem, but it's not a creeping stem. Look at this tiny little thing coming close to us. He's only about 10 meters away, 30 feet. Just completely comfortable. It's a wonderful view of how they eat. You can see them on their knees there. And these will be very well worn by now. And just watch and see how he uses that snout to push plants he doesn't want out the way. And also perhaps to dig a little bit so that he can get at those rhizomes, the good carbohydrate rich root stocks of those grass plants. This is brilliant. Hmm. Looks like she's got two little males. And you can tell that because they've both got two sets of warts. I just don't want to start the engine, everyone, so you're going to have to deal with the aerials in your picture, I'm afraid, because if I do start the engine, I think they'll run away at high speed, tails in the air, running like little aerials, well, a bit like the ones you're looking at, unfortunately, through the bush. What a brilliant, brilliant sighting. So those little tails stick up as soon as they need to run away from something, they stick those tails up and run, and I think it's so that they can follow each other through the thick, thick stuff. They're going through long grass. It helps them to see where each other have gone. All right, that's now becoming a fairly difficult sighting. All right, I think that's fantastic. That's, that's the best warthog sighting I've had here. They just didn't care about us at all. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Right, the dam is just up here. I did see two buffalo moving across the road, and I wonder if they aren't part of that herd that I saw, or that we all saw, of course, around the Juma Dam pan this morning. Probably about 250 strong. Good size herd. Certainly for this area. So maybe the rest of them are at the water or lying up in the shade just to the south of the water. Oh. Andrew, there's a giant sound of warthogs. Sorry, everyone. You know, warthogs galore. I don't think it's any coincidence at all that we are so close to the water and there are this many warthogs. So that's probably two sows and their attendant offspring. How many babies? Look, three of them are suckling. Well, they're all suckling. Five youngsters. Three in one litter, two in the other. Hmm. So you can see very clearly, therefore, that they're not territorial. 
They don't normally, I mean, they won't have enormous sounders of warthogs in one area. <laughs> that looks deeply painful. Good grief. Hello, cat in Tampa. Very nice. He was obviously watching and sitting on their knees and walking through the bush like that, and you want to know if they've got calluses on their knees when they're born. Cats, as far as I know, they don't. I think they just develop them. They might have a slightly hardened patella, which is the knee joint, of course. It's possible. I'm not sure. They wouldn't have a patella there, though, because that's the front leg. So I'd, they may have a little bit of extra cartilage there. So the knee joint that you can see there is the equivalent of your wrist joint. That is an astonishing picture. That is fantastic to see, isn't that great? Now, I would say that these little ones are probably about a month old. If I was to guess, I wouldn't put any money on that, but that's what I'd say. This is beautiful. So I was just saying about the territoriality, obviously they, these, this lot are living in close proximity to that other female and her two youngsters. And were they territorial animals, of course, that wouldn't be possible. But because they aren't, they will utilize sort of every available resource that they can. You'll find that the sounders will move closer and closer to the water as time goes on. They will have a fairly defined home range in normal circumstances, but I think you'll find those home ranges will become shrunken and they'll move closer and closer to water as the drought progresses. Very, very dangerous for them to take those little ones off to the water now. And I would think that most of the moisture requirements of the little piglets is coming from suckling. Isn't that wonderful? Panting, they're quite hot. Oh, tired. Even being a mother is a very tiring job, of course. Ah, now, this is precisely why I said it was the, the knee joint isn't a knee joint at all. What's always fascinated me about mammals is the fact that we're pretty much all put together the same way. And Wendy, you were wondering about whether those are knees or ankles that they were sort of with the, when they're crawling along. They're actually the equivalent of your wrist joint. They're not the equivalent of knees or ankles. So if you think of the front legs of the warthog being your front legs or your front feet, the elbow joint is the one just underneath kind of the warthog's armpit. That's the elbow joint. The wrist joint is the one just, the one that they lean on when they're feeding on the ground. It looks like they're walking on their knees. That isn't the knee joint, it's the ankle joint. And then below that will be kind of a, a fused collection of what would be your hand bones. Just all different shapes, obviously. But the bends are all in the same place. Now, if you really want to find out about this, grab your house cat or your dog, sedate them sufficiently, and just have a look at their legs. And I know a lot of you have got cats at home and dogs. But if you look, if you feel around the joints just under the cat's armpit or the dog's armpit, you'll feel an elbow joint. It's exactly the same as your elbow. And then that knee joint in the, on the front leg is actually the equivalent of your wrist. And if you look at the back leg, the most interesting thing is that the, what would be your knee is again up sort of close to the belly. And then the ankle joint is elongated, and especially on a cat or a dog, that bend in the back leg of the knee, um, on a, what on a horse would be called the fetlock. No, not the fetlock, the hock. That hock joint is actually the equivalent of your ankle joint. I think it's fascinating. But they all, if you're in doubt, the joints bend the same way. So the joints on you, the joints on your cat, the joints on a bat will bend the same way, well, more or less. And that's how you can figure out which joint is which and which equivalent there is on you and your cat. Right, let us head to the water. The warthogs are thoroughly bored with us. Let us carry on.
And I mean, the most, I was saying this the other day, but the most interesting part about that, for example, go and look at a picture of a bat, and you will see a bat's wings, of course, are actually its hands. They're the bones that hold the membrane in place are the hand bones. The metacarpals, I think they're called, or the carpals, one's feet and one's hands. Right, here is the water. There was a giraffe just up ahead. Oh, there's the giraffe. There are three giraffe. We've seen these three giraffe a few nights in a row now. Thank you very much, Steph. This is a wonderful update all the way from Namibia, everybody. While we look at these giraffe that we've been seeing for a few days now, bull in attendance with mother and calf. She may be coming into Estrus. Steph, you say that the El Nino, while El Nino has created very dry conditions here, Namibia is actually very wet at the moment, and the Huanib River and the Kunene rivers are now flowing all the way into the skeleton coast. Now that, you say, is a once in a decade occurrence. Fascinating stuff. And I don't know if anybody out there has been to Namibia. It is scenically possibly the most magnificent place on planet Earth. And while the wildlife is, well, it's brilliant, but it's slightly more sparse than I suppose it would be here, the scenery you will see in Namibia especially along those rivers, especially the Huanib River, will take your breath away at every turn. There goes Aubrey and Taxon getting mobile. I'm just going to quickly tell them there's no update. No updates, two stations from Wild Earth Mobile. So she's definitely coming into Estrus or thinking about coming into Estrus because he is most interested. He has not a care for that youngster behind him. He does not care one jot about the health and well-being of the little one behind. All he is thinking about is, well, mating. Yes, you see, they're trying to hide behind the bush there. They know they're on camera. Let's sneak a little bit forward. There are a couple of other things having a drink there. There are some Voltebuck. There seems to be a Nyala as well. And the buffalo, two buffalo, and a hippopotamus. You can see he will just, he won't kind of harass her, but well, I mean, I think harassment is probably not too far off what he's doing. Andrew, was it with you that we saw those two galloping off into the sunset off the Arethusa airstrip? Do you remember mm, that? Negative. Two giraffe, exactly the situation, it went on for about 25 minutes. He tried his luck and tried his luck, and eventually she just started galloping. She galloped off, and we watched them. We were on that high point of the Arethusa airstrip. And she must have run probably two kilometers while we watched with him galloping behind her. Can you imagine how irritating that must be for her? And you can imagine if they are speaking in that infrasonic way that they're supposed to be able to, you can imagine how um, vociferous, her infrasonic communications are right now. What you can see there, obviously, is the incredible size difference between a bull and a cow. She's full grown, he's also full grown, but he is, uh, he's probably a third again the size that she is. They're walking in amongst some kudu as well. So a very rich mammal species diversity here, buffalo. And you can just hear a few birds in the background. Sounds like a sabota lark calling. Hmm. 
beautiful scenes and just very peaceful. I'm quiet for the next 15 seconds. See if you, see what you can hear. Now what you can hear there is the ultimate peace of a late African afternoon, especially in a drought, because the birds are just that much more quiet. There's a robin calling. It sounds like there's a lark calling, but otherwise all is silent. There's a lovely, gentle, cool breeze blowing out of the southeast. And all the animals are coming down for a quick sip to drink before moving away again to head off for their evening feeding. Just about all the animals out here are what we call crepuscular, and that means that they're active day or dawn and dusk, and they try and avoid the night time because that is a time of danger when the lions and the leopards roam. And then they will also avoid the heat of the day because it's just deeply unpleasant. Right, quickly, run, girl. He's having a drink. It's the one thing that will distract a man. No, maybe she's, maybe she's just playing hard to get and she quite likes him. Mr. Moustache, back in Chicago, I think it is, or Michigan, you asked a question to which I have forgotten all of the exact figures but you want to know the size of a giraffe's heart and how much pressure there is that helps the blood to go to the brain. The heart, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm going to ask Geraldine to just do a quick googly check for me, I think that the heart of a giraffe is roughly mm, 25 kilograms. I think it's bigger than an elephant's heart, if I'm not mistaken. That's 25 pounds, sorry, 25 pounds which is actually smaller than an elephant's heart. So an elephant's heart can go up to 21 kilograms, which is about 45 pounds, and 25 pounds for a giraffe's heart. Now the pressure inside the blood vessels, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what that is. We'll try and find out for you, but I guess it does change up to the brain. And obviously the question has been asked about why this, or what the pressure is because of the pressure, obvious pressure that builds up when a giraffe puts its head down, its brain threatens to explode. And so it does have to lift its head up quite quickly. It can't keep the head down for long. Here come the buffalo, Andrew. Two big bulls. Very picturesque little peaceful scenes. Now, the other day, I know Jamie saw a young bull with a whole lot of old bulls. And the question was asked, why on earth would a young bull be with a whole lot of old bulls? And it was seemingly very unusual. It's not that unusual. I think you'll find that these bulls, which we often write off as old and past their prime, probably do link up with the herds as they go past. And so in so doing, they'll pick up a young bull who doesn't quite have the size to compete for mating opportunities. So he'll lurk around with the old boys, learning a bit from them before they join up with the herd again. Now, James Taylor, you've obviously been watching for a while and you know that giraffe fight using their necks. And you want to know if the female would ever fight with a male like that. And the answer is no. They don't fight with their necks. It's why they don't have those balding horns that's a really nice shot of his hooves there, Andrew. And the dust. You can just see the dust coming up. For this time of year, that is just, it's bizarre to see. They always look so lumbering and clumsy. But I tell you what, that buffalo will move at a speed that you and I could never hope to match. Beautiful. Right, well, I think we should probably press on from here. Let's head across to Arethusa, just get an update from the morning, see if there was anything there. I don't think we'll spend too long there 
unless there's something pretty spectacular to look at. And then we'll head back onto Juma, possibly just around the area where the, the wild dogs went south, hoping that they come back up to quarantine to eat an impala there later on as the sun goes down. Let's head back to Jamie, get an update from her, and I will see you in the far west. So this afternoon, you might be wondering why I'm sort of clearly pulling into a tree here, or the frantic pace of this morning. It's now nice and quiet this afternoon, so I have a difficult track quiz for you. It might be particularly tricky for some of our newer viewers, but let's see if our regulars can figure it out. There's a line in the sand. There's a track that runs along the right side of the road. There you go. All the way up. It's not uniform, it changes, it wanders around from side to side <laughs> and all the way up the road. So, let's see who can tell me what made that line in the road. And because it's an interesting one, I will say this for you. I'll give you one hint, two hints. One, it's not an elephant and two, it's not a drag mark. Let's see if you can figure out what on earth this has made this line in the sand. I'm very curious to hear, and you can obviously send that through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And I'm trying to think. Let's see. Let's see how it goes with the answers. I'm trying to think about whether I should give you one more clue or whether I should leave it at that. What made the track in the I think that's it for now. Let's see if you can figure it out. If, if it becomes a struggle, maybe. I mean, you guys could catch on in two seconds and I could be mistaken. It might not be a tricky one. But let us see. And on to Bubbles for Cutlines. Since James has already checked the... Sorry. Bear with me one second. I might have pulled myself out of my own track here. Ended up this road about a week ago. And that track just hasn't quite been obliterated yet by moving vehicles and other hooved animals. Speaking of the Nkuhumas, just an update. It looks as though they're going to move from Nkoro into the Kruger National Park. So that's where those ladies, all five of them together, have all rejoined the female that was mating with the Birmingham boys and has rejoined the rest of the group. And they've wandered off further to the east. I'm quite surprised by the distance that they've decided to travel, but I guess that is just where they want to be at the moment. The Birmingham boys, I think it was two of them, plus some of the sticks females, are on Torchwood, last I heard. So that is your line update for the afternoon. You never know when they, a pride is going to come wandering on, and of course we haven't seen the Shemulwe pride in a very extended period of time. They are still around, every now and again I get an update. And the Shimungues, for new viewers wondering about what I'm talking about, the Shimungues are three young sub-adults all on their own. The rest of the pride has been killed one by one, either by hyenas or by other lions, leaving behind three young lions, two females and one male, that Viem, one of our cameramen, is nicknamed Oliver, because he's orphaned. And they've done incredibly well. They're, they're pretty much existing purely on scavenging. They're not really, at this point, experienced enough or strong or big enough to hunt for themselves, although I'm sure every now and again they get lucky and they manage to catch an impala or an yala. But for the most part, I think they've been existing by hunting. I mean, by scavenging, sorry, by scavenging rather than hunting. They might pop out. So Dylan and Mauricia. Oh, sorry, not. Can you just get these names straight? I was thinking. There we go. So it's Dylan and Mauricia 
have said in answer to my quiz that it's a python. And Brian, you've suggested that maybe it's a monitor lizard. And Lisa as well also suggested monitor lizards. Unfortunately not, we're both wrong, and I'll tell you why. First of all, with pythons, you get that much more uniform movement, even when they've been basking. It's not a bad, not a bad guess. I can sort of see what you mean, but you'd, you'd see some degree of serpentine motion within it. Hello, elephant. So I've been looking everywhere for you. Oh. Hello, other elephant. Sorry, Yuri. Oh, old girl. Aren't you beautiful? And in answer to why it's not a water monitor, also a very good guess, but there's no tracks on either side of where that tail print would, that uh, presumably you think he gets the tail print or the print of the body. Look at this old female. Look how sunken her forehead is. Fascinating. What's got you so stressed, big girl? Secreting from those temporal glands, but you can really see the degree of the sort of the indentation between her ear and her eye and how prominent her cheekbones are. And that is a very clear sign of an older elephant. I would say this gorgeous grandmother is probably somewhere in the region of about 50, 60. Hey, big girl, you are beautiful. I would say this is a very old elephant. Maybe 60 is a little bit of a high estimate, maybe 45 to 55. And secreting from those temporal glands, she's had some kind of stress. I don't know if it's... Hello, girl. It's all right. I wonder what incredible things this female has witnessed in her years in the Kruger National Park. That's a long, long time have wandered about with her family. And of course, these older elephants tend to be the matriarchs, usually the oldest female within a group, unless they get to really infirm and aged. And it's almost like, can you see how it looks as though her skin is hanging off her? And it's not really because she's too thin, although she is quite thin. And I think it's more just a question of age. Her skin has lost a little bit of electric, um, elasticity. Not electricity, she doesn't have electric skin. Awesome. Thank you, old girl. I love seeing elephants of that sort of age, and she's probably right at the end of her, not quite, but coming close to the end of her lifespan. And one of the reasons that she started to become thin in that way is because elephants in their lives go through six sets of molars. I'm actually not even going to turn on, I'm just going to roll quietly forward to get us a view of a younger member of the herd. But elephants go through six sets of molars. I know you, it's okay. All right, what's the matter? What's well, got you guys stressed out? The whole herd is secreting from their temporal glands, which is usually a sign of stress. And Kay Gerald, you were wondering, just to finish off our discussion, as this elephant has a dust bath, you were wondering how old can an elephant get? Now, I estimated the age of that old lady at probably about between 45 to 55. They can live all the way up to 60. And as I said, they go through six sets of, hello, you're going to come say hello. Little boy. Oh, yes, very intimidating and very scary. Very scary. You, yes, hello. I love it when the young males look at you like that. Head up, ears out, look how big and scary I am. I'm intimidated. What do you think, Brian? Oh, he's very scary. He's very scary. <laughs> Hello, little boy. Go to your granny. Oh, oh, so cheeky. So brave. <laughs> and they're so funny when they do that because they act all big and brave and scary and almost inevitably, straight afterwards, they dash away in terror. Hey boy, 
You're so cheeky. Hello, girl. I'm not doing anything to your baby, girl. Hello, girly. It's all right. I'm not doing anything to your baby. He's causing trouble with me. Promise. All right, girl. Okay. He started it, I promise. It was him. A little bit more distressed. Showing a bit of signs of stress. And on these hot days and during these drought periods, it's always important to really respect that about the animals and respect their personal space, of course, particularly with elephants. But they are very drought stressed and they've obviously could well have either had an encounter with a vehicle moving quite fast because they are on a main access road that isn't necessarily just guides, but also may have had an encounter with a large bull that might have harassed them. So I'm just going to let them move further behind me before I reposition and then we'll have another view of them. And while I do that, let me go forward actually, then I can turn around and view them from that side. While we do that, I was finishing off answering the question on whether or how old elephants can get and I chatted a bit about their molars and Kay Jeld, you were wondering about it and I said they can live up to about 60. So what essentially happens in the lifespan of an elephant is they've got two molars on the top, two molars on the bottom and they will replace those molars in an almost conveyor belt like motion about six times in their lives. By the time they get to their sixth and final set of teeth and as you can emerge, imagine with constant munching they wear them down fairly quickly over the years and they do feed pretty much almost constantly so by the time they get to their sixth set you find that they are quite worn down i'm going to give this elephant plenty of space and just see how she reacts it was her son that was causing trouble with me in the first place but of course we are in their home and in their personal space so it's important to respect that. Here we go. We can stop right here. So by the time the elephant will finally finish answering the question for poor old Kay, by the time they get to their 50s, they have got down to their last set of teeth and they start to wear those down eventually getting to the point where they're not efficiently chewing their food and thereby making digest the entire digestive process a bit more tricky. And elephants as it is, don't have the most effective digestive process. They excrete about half of what they eat. About half of that disappears and isn't utilized by their bodies. You can imagine how much food you need to maintain a size like that. So when they start to get older, they lose condition, just like that lovely old female that we saw earlier. And you get a little bit thinner. And you often find undigested chunks of food in their dung. And I know that Darlene has asked about tracking and what you can figure out from the signs the animal left behind. And Darlene, that's one of the things that you can look at with elephant dung, is you can sort of tell their age from how much content is, or how much undigested content is in their dung. Very often you'll see whole pieces of leaves and branches, which usually suggests an older elephant. And Janet, Khat and Raisa have said, sent through their answers about, as we watch, speaking about elephant dung and the animals we see. And I must say, the three of you have given a really good answer. It's not right, but it is good thinking out of the box. They've suggested that perhaps that track that I showed you is made by a dung beetle rolling a dung wall. And I'm very impressed with that one. That was a very, very good answer. The track is a little bit too wide. I mean, that dung ball would have had to have been about the size of, over the size of a tennis ball, which is possible, but unlikely. And generally they tend to bob and weave a little bit more. And you might see the beetle tracks around them. Although you have given me a really good idea for my next track quiz. I'm gonna throw that one out there at some point. I think that was a very clever answer. Thinking out of the box. 
right now. I think I might have been a bit naughty. You guys might get a bit cross with me when you do realize what the answer is or when I tell you what the answer is. So I'll give you one more hint. And I'm trying to think of how to hint with, um, with what it is. I will say that I've seen it on most of the roads on Juma. And if James goes to Arethusa today, he probably won't see it. He's less likely to see it. Hello, little boy. Do you mind me being this close where you're going to come and pretend to be enormous? Hmm? <laughs> Shame, I don't want to stress them out further. Now, although he has given me those signs, and it's very cute when little male elephants do that, it is a product of, I think, in this particular instance, and often they do it just because they're being playful or naughty, but I think in this particular instance they are actually feeling stressed. I don't want to push any closer. And those secretions from the temporal glands in, occur in both females and males, and very often in a reaction to stress. It can sometimes be, it's not entirely proven that it isn't related to other emotions as well, so happiness or excitement, for example. But generally my experience is Elephants that have secreted from their temporal glands are quite often a little bit skittish and a little bit more on edge. And it's one of those amazing things about the social structure of an elephant herd, because you can imagine if all of your, if you're secreting from your temporal glands, all of your friends are secreting, or your family members are secreting from their temporal glands, and you're sort of awash with that scent around you, then everybody almost shares the emotion of the herd. So each individual elephant will feel what the others are feeling. It's a fascinating thought. They're more attuned to each other's moods than certainly human beings are. Imagine being awash in somebody else's emotions. Actually, Mr. Moustache has said that he's, his question is silly. And Mr. Moustache, I think it's a very good question. He wanted to know, do elephants ever get blocked trunks or stuffy noses? Like we might get when we have a cold or a flu. And it's not a silly question at all. They do occasionally get inflammation of the lining, although as with all animals, their immune system is far more effective than ours is. And I'm, I'm gonna try and move a bit closer just to give Brian something to be able to show you. They are hiding this afternoon. I think he's gonna cross the road though. <laughs> Mr. Moustache, they do, and they sneeze. They get stuff stuck up their trunk and they have a good sneeze. And that whole lining of the trunk is very, very moist. It's not dry at all. It's probably more moist than our own mucous membranes within our nostrils. Fluffy G. Fluffy G has hopped onto the right train of thought. Very well done. It's not a bike, but you are absolutely correct. I didn't say it was an animal. So there you go. Fluffy G has put it out there. I also mentioned that I have seen it particularly on the roads in Juma today in particular, and that James probably won't find any on Arethusa today. It was a really tricky one. So Fluffy G, I'm impressed. I'm fairly certain I didn't. I just told you that it was a track. <laughs> and now I'm, going, now I'm going to have cross people thinking that I've tricked them. Why is it important to include man-made tracks within your tracking vocabulary? And that is what it is, essentially. We're helping you to build up a tracking vocabulary. Reading, learning to read the signs and the newsprint of the bush and the messages that have been left for you to find, the clues to be followed. There's our lovely old girl. And the answer is because we are as much of a part of this world now as the animals are at this point. Yes, we are very much in their home and in their space, but it's important to know and being able to tell the difference between a man-made track and an animal-made one. Might seem like a silly distinction, but again, as I've spoken to you about tracks of little animals, it's important in aging tracks 
It also, as it happens, this particular track, or what left this particular track, makes our lives a bit easier in terms of tracking. Yes. If I move backwards a bit, we might have a slightly clearer view of another elephant in the herd, also looking stressed. And I love that comment coming from Sharon, who has said that when we look at that old elephant cow that's part of this herd, it makes you wonder how far, how many miles has that elephant covered in her life? That's an awesome thought. How many, how many miles? They can walk and cover 25, 30 kilometers in a day. Every day for the last 55 years, up and down, backwards and forwards, walking paths that she must know as well as we know our route home. And maybe our route to the favorite shopping center or the favorite mall or wherever you happen to buy your groceries. And she must have seen droughts come and go, people come and go, all kinds of climatic conditions. A bit of an ear shake, get rid of some of the dust. And as you can see, or you could see before the elephant ducked behind a bush, also secreting from those temporal glands. To continuation of Mr. Moustache's question and the fact that they sometimes get stuffy trunks, Pamela would like to know if I've ever heard an elephant sneeze or seen an elephant sneeze. And I have, and it's quite a bizarre thing. It's more a sort of an explosion of air from the trunk, often accompanied by plenty of dust. But you can imagine how when they wrap their trunks around the dirt and throw it over their shoulders like that, you can imagine how much dirt gets stuck up their nostrils or breathe, breathed in accidentally. Even if they don't breathe while they do it, it's still a process that's going to it's definitely impart dust particles. And if the elephants are anything like Brian and myself at the moment, they're going to be sneezing their way through the day. We've been seriously suffering with the dust, and <laughs> particularly after two frantic wild dog mornings. I don't know how Brian is feeling, but I'm also sneezing with itchy eyes and burning nostrils racing around in dust. And Jen and Bill and Video Mark have all come pretty much, well, I would say very close to getting it right. They've suggested that a log or a stick dragged down the road and quite often you will see in tracks on the road where a vehicle has driven evidence of where they've been off-roading and have caught a stick or a log generally not a log hopefully but certainly sticks occasionally get caught under the car we've done it ourselves many times and probably most of us have pulled it out on air as well and that does leave tracks very very similar to the ones that we saw earlier You've probably come the closest so far. There's one. Mm, I'm not going to say any more. I was about to give it away. Okay, boy. Please don't come and get cross again. It's okay. <laughs> Shannon. Shannon's <laughs> possibly humorous guess, or very humorous guess, was that it might have been James's antenna dragging along. Also valid. Very valid, although I should hope that he hasn't driven down most of the roads of Juma without noticing the dangling antenna. Although, you'd be surprised, you get distracted. Hello, boy. Are you chilled now? Hmm? Or are you going to come and act big and scary again? Maybe not with Mom so far away. Nope, thinking about it. Quick dust bath. Get some dust particles up his nose. Well, that's not very obliging. <laughs> now, 
while we leave our elephant herd and go off in search of other wonders to show you, I believe that James has also found some elephants. So while you ponder on the answer to my track quiz, let's pop over and have a look at James's elephants. Look at that, everyone. A magnificent set of three elephant bulls. Young one to the right, two, I would say, 40-year-old behemoths to in the middle and on the left there. They've just been in the Arethusa Dam having a bit of a swim, probably eating some of the water vegetation there, and now they're just having a little bit of a rest before they move off to start the endless process of trying to eat enough food to keep their bodies going. And I was just saying, we, do, we are in the middle of a virtual reality shoot as well. I was just saying that the young bull there, if you saw him on his own, he'd be quite impressive. I mean, I think he's probably standing, what, Andrew, about nine feet at the shoulder. These other two are probably sitting at about 11 feet at the shoulder. They are maybe even 12. They're enormous. You can just hear them breathing out. <sighs> out of the trunk there. And the trunk is just resting on the ground there because it's heavy. He's just relaxed all those muscles and they're arranged in a sort of spiral. And so the trunk becomes like a concertina. It does stretch and retract depending on how he uses those muscles. And some elephants get something called floppy trunk syndrome where because they're, they either get a disease or they're just a bit lazy with them, the muscles that hold the trunk up become very weakened and they have to watch out. They, you know, the trunk eventually becomes permanently attached to the ground like that or permanently extended. I don't think this one is, I think he's just resting. That was just the beeping of the virtual reality rig. And we've turned off now. Magnificent eyelashes on that fellow. Isn't that amazing? He keeps think, looks, looking like he's thinking about moving, but then I think the heat of the peace of the summer afternoon overcomes him, and he decides he'll just stand there for a little bit longer. That, of course, is why he's called a pachyderm, a wrinkly grey skin. And they're born with that skin, you know. They're not born with smooth skin. The term smooth as a baby's bottom does not apply to an elephant calf. Magnificent ivory on that fellow. You can just, I don't know if you can hear, but the the ears are going Hello, Olden Zoll in the Netherlands. I'm not sure we've heard from you before, have we, Olden Zoll? Olden Zoll, you want to know how long an elephant will sleep for? Olden Zoll, I think an elephant will, a big bull like this, will probably only sleep for a maximum of four or five hours a day. A lot of that, I suspect, will be just dozing, like this fellow is dozing. Younger ones will sleep a bit longer, but it tends to be a rule of thumb that the larger you are as a mammal, the less you have to sleep. Now, I'm sorely tempted to move a bit forward, but I don't want to disturb them, and I think that, you know, they look like they might actually approach us as they go down to the water. The youngster is having a drink now behind us. Oops, there goes my VR rig. So there's the youngster. Now, if you were to see him on his own, like I say, I mean, he looks, he's an impressive fellow. But he does not compare with these other chaps. Here we go, Andrew. Mm. 
So he's just come to say hello to us. I think he's going to go to the water. I hope he's going to go to the water. Isn't that just spectacular? So all he was doing there is coming to say hello, well, kind of saying, here I am. And I'm going to have a drink and don't get in my way. Now he's watching us carefully. So keep an eye out to the left and to the right. One on the right is watching us very carefully. He's listening to my voice. I've no doubt he has no idea what I'm saying to him, but he is listening to my voice. So I'll just quieten it down a bit. And there he goes. He's decided he'll like to have a drink. Now let's see what the other chap does. This guy, of course, has got the most impressive ivory. But he also looks to be the most relaxed and the most sleepy. Now, the other two are standing off to the right-hand side there, just kind of, I don't know, maybe talking to each other infrasonically well, this fellow sits with the... Oh, here we go. He is a brilliant specimen, is he not? Fantastic-looking elephant. Do you hear that? As his ears thrashed against his back. Isn't that fantastic? That is so exciting. I'm just going to quickly turn around and we're just going to sync the VR quickly. Oh dear. I'm glad we didn't have to make a hasty retreat there, Andrew. up onto the concrete causeway there. I hope you're not going to try and go across it. No, they're both going up onto the top there. That's the youngster in front. The other big bull is now in the middle of the water there. And he's looking like he's going to have a bite to eat from the water vegetation. I'm going to approach with a certain amount of care because I don't want him to feel at all cornered. He must feel completely comfortable to move away from us if he wants to. And likewise, the one behind us there on the right must feel completely comfortable to come to the water if he can. Also an African jacana, you can see, just landed behind him, a lily trotter bird and a youngster watching from the top. He's definitely not quite as comfortable in his skin as these two older ones. And while they both gave us a look, they certainly weren't in the least bit sort of threatened by us, where this youngster, and I only say youngster because he's with these much older fellows, is not quite the same. Right, here comes the one from the right. We're going to keep an eye out on all of them quite carefully. And if we need to move away, then we will. So what's important here is that they don't feel threatened by us. So if they begin to show any kind of discomfort with us, we will move away. This is fantastic, everyone. This is incredible. Well, there's no doubt who's the boss here, is there? <laughs> Isn't that great? This is amazing. Oh, I'm sorry, I've clicked my earpiece out. So 
Sorry, Kirsten, my ear's been out. If you wish to ask me a question, go ahead now. Hello, Fluffy G. You want to know if the swaggering one is in must? I don't think any of them are in must, to be honest. I think they're both... Look at this. This is, this is just fantastic. I don't think either of them are in must. They don't, they're not dripping from their penises. They'd be dripping that green, slimy, stinking stuff if they were in must. They'd probably also be streaming from their temporal glands if they were in must, and they don't seem to be at the moment. So I don't think they're in must at all, no. There's the youngster on the the top of the wall there and it's amazing to me you know often when you viewing elephants on foot and that sort of thing you tend to think of them being uh, fairly lumbering and not very agile he's climbed up a you know a pretty a pretty steep bank there with no trouble at all so they're much more agile than we think they are using the trunk all the time to smell what we want. I'm sure there's some strange smells coming out of the camp. On top there, he'll be talking now, they're communicating. The young bull and his mentor are communicating. I don't know what they're saying to each other, of course, they don't speak anything. Just in front of the elephant is a tiny little bird, a little three-banded plover flying around. I'm going to start whispering now, just because I don't want them to react to my voice at all. The one on the right is now depositing some soccer ball-sized dung, up to 150 kilograms a day of that dung. We might get ourselves sprayed in mud here. Look at them now having an interaction. This is incredible. This is just the most fantastic sighting. Excuse my head, everybody. I just don't want to duck down and miss something that might be indicative of the need to move. Like that. Yeah, I'm going to think about backing off now because I think this, this one on the right is feeling a little bit compromised. I'm just going to move slightly back just so that they have a little bit of space. Now, we could probably have sat there, but I just wanted to make a little bit of space for them to move in, in case they felt cornered. But I think they're okay. sighting. I don't know if you heard that, but you would have seen it over there. If you're looking on the VR rig, you would have seen the hippo just bubbling up there over the top to the left. Now, that's an indicator that he's just saying, listen, I don't really want you to get any closer to me, which we won't. If he shows any other kinds of discomfort, we will move off again. We'll just back off again, a similar sort of distance to the one that we did there.
Okay, he's got a bit close now. I don't want to start the engine unless we have to, simply because if I do, he's going to perhaps react. That said, I may have to. Heart is racing. <laughs> How's yours, Andrew? I'm good. Well, that's because you're insane. doesn't also want to be sandwiched between two of them. <laughs> right. You can see the one on the right is a male. They are all males. What an unbelievable sighting. <laughs> that that was just spectacular. Now, he didn't show us any form of aggression. He just came to see what we wanted. And he's in the water, eating away at some of this water hyacinth. I wish, wish they'd eat a lot more of it. It's an exotic invader. But he's still, the big one is smelling us now because the wind is coming from the east of us straight into the west. And his trunk is lifted and he is trying to smell us now. Sorry, I know there are one or two questions coming through from the final control, but I'm just getting static in my ears, so I'm afraid I can't answer them at the moment. I will as soon as I can hear them, though. Isn't that a beautiful backlit scene of the two elephants? What a truly phenomenal sighting. How are you feeling, Andrew? Feeling good. Isn't it, a, isn't it the ultimate high? Mm. <laughs> They're quite big when they get super close. They are quite, they are quite big when they, they get, get super bigger. close. They get yes. bigger. They get bigger. <laughs> Sounds obvious. I'm just going to back off a little bit. I'm just worried that these two perhaps aren't coming down to have something to eat because we're a bit close. They're maybe not quite as bold as the other one. I don't think so. But let's just back off up a little bit on top here and see if they don't come down and join their cohort in the water. Should do it. Also, some buffalo now to the left-hand side coming in to have a drink. Three cows. Two cows and one bull. That's a very unusual sized herd. I wonder if they aren't the pathfinders for a much bigger herd. So I think our decision there to back off is justified by the fact that the little one now felt comfortable to come down again. And I, again, I say little one under advisement. I mean, he's, he's not little. He's probably about three and a half tons. These other two are pushing six tons. So three and a half thousand kilograms for the little one, and I'd say 6,000 kilograms for the big ones. And in pounds, that's pushing about, what, 14,000 pounds for one land-bound animal. Astonishing stuff. And to me, if you were to ever ask me who the king of the wild is out here, seeing that bull standing there, I don't believe there can ever be any doubt, can there? Here comes the other one. Bit more comfortable that distance, Andrew.
Uh, now, Tom, Thomas, I'm just going to quickly clap and do this sink because otherwise I think we're going to lose it. Um, Tom in Dallas, a very valid question as to why they're not eating a lot. They're kind of going in, having a snack or two, and then coming out again. Tom, I think you find that that is going to be because this is not ideal stuff for them to eat. I think you'll find it, it tastes quite aromatic. It's probably got quite a lot of oil in it. And, I mean, it isn't exotic, so it would certainly not form part of an elephant's natural diet. I don't think it'll harm them at all. They're very good at picking up on things that might poison them. So I think it just doesn't taste great and it's probably not very good forage for them. There's some water buck coming in now from the left. It's all happening here, the Arethusa Dam. Buffalo and three of the most magnificent elephants I've ever seen. Now, survey, you're on YouTube, and I think it's a very good question. You're a new viewer. What is, are the signs of aggression? What should we watch out for when an elephant is cross with us? Uh, survey, there are a few things. The first thing is that very obvious shake of the head, that first kind of whoosh, which is just saying, I'm watching you. Pob, possibly don't come any closer. Other obvious signs of aggression, of course, would be an elephant chasing you. That would be a very clear sign that the elephant was very cross with you and didn't want you around the place. But between the first initial head shake and the time that you decide to run away at a great speed, there are a few signs to look out for. One of them would be kind of classic displacement behavior, where they stand and they fiddle with their, with their limbs and they kind of you know, they'll stand with one leg up and look at the ewe like that, and they'll pretend to feed. And that's kind of saying, I'm not comfortable with you. I'm not aggressive, but I'm not feeling comfortable at the moment. And then when they truly are very upset, they will turn and come towards you, often with their heads up first. And if you don't then back off, that can turn into, people call that a mock charge. I don't believe there's such a thing. When an elephant comes at you with his head up, yes, he might not be about to hit you, but he's saying, go away now, because what he can then do is drop his head and come. And that's what you really don't want, of course. So that elephant that came up so close to us wasn't showing any signs of aggression. He walked out of the, out of the water. I mean, we're being very careful, of course, because he, you know, what could be a totally innocuous situation could immediately escalate if something irritates him. Perhaps the wind changes, he catches a whiff of us. Uh, perhaps, I don't know, the VR rig on the front goes beep, 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 and that makes him upset. So we're very careful when they're that close, but he didn't show any signs of obvious upsetness. That's the VR deciding that it's had enough, Andrew. I'm gonna turn it off. So, thank you very much for your screenshots, everybody. And equally, thank you for your uh, concern for Andrew and my safety. I am very much in the school of thought that uh, if in doubt, you run away. So, I didn't feel any need. I mean, certainly my heart rate went up when that six-ton elephant bull was this close to us. But I certainly didn't feel at any stage like there was a need to start the engine and reverse at a great speed. Jeannie, a fascinating question to which I'm not sure I know the answer. You want to know, I guess, a bit like human beings. Do they eat less when it's hot? Um, Jeannie, I don't think they eat less when it's hot. I think that they eat probably as, as much, but they certainly have to drink a bit more. Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, the reason you would eat more when it's cold is because, or well, many animals will eat more when it's cold, is because they need to maintain body temperature. Now, an elephant, of course, is an enormous thing, and maintaining body temperature, if you're that big, is not that hard. So, you know, when it's cold and when it's hot, I don't think it makes an enormous amount of difference as to what they eat. Certainly, they will drink more when it's hot like this. Look at that eye covered in beautiful mud mascara there. <laughs> A 
Gracie, hello. You're eight, of course, in Ohio, and you're very appreciative of the elephants that we have shown you. My pleasure, Gracie. I'm very glad that Andrew and I could bring you your elephants. And you say it makes you feel better and you'd like to cuddle with them. And do I think they would mind your being moving with them? Gracie, I think for most people, they would not like it at all. But I think for you, these big elephant bulls would probably make an exception. I think they would definitely like to move around with you for a little while. Not sure about the cuddle, though, Gracie. I think cuddling a 14,000-pound elephant bull is perhaps pushing it a little bit far. I just thought I heard a monkey alarm calling. We are, of course, fully in Shadow's domain over here. It would be very nice to see her slinking out from the undergrowth to the eastern side of the water. But I have not seen her slinking out from the undergrowth to the eastern side of the water. What a wonderful scene this is. And often, you know, if I go to a bush place and people say, well, why don't, don't you want to go on game drive? And this is normally if I'm, I don't know, doing a talk or playing the guitar or something or like that, I normally refuse because if it's sitting in front of a water hole like this, there's nothing more peaceful and more wonderful in the world than to sit on a deck with your favorite snifter, a good book, an excellent pair of binoculars, unlike the ones I own, and looking at what comes down to drink the birds, the animals or the mammals, and just sucking in the atmosphere of the silence of a beautiful bushveld afternoon. question through here from Big Dave. Hello, Big Dave. Um, you want to know where the water came from in the Arethusa Dam. I don't think they pump it. I think it's largely rainwater. I think it would have, you know, we're kind of in a marshy area here, big dam wall. And I think that over the years, there have been a couple of very really good rain years of late. And I think you'll find that it's filled up naturally through flow down the drainage line that empties into this. And I mean, it carries on down, down the way. You can see the big trees over the top of the dam wall there, and they line a sort of dry stream or dry riverbed down towards the western side there. So I think that's just natural flow. They might pump it a little bit, but I don't think so. Right, well, I feel like the sighting is drawing to a close, don't you, Andrew? I think we'll press on from here. It has been the most incredible sighting here. I'm gonna take a moment to just suck it in and appreciate it, and we'll hand you over to Jamie while I do that and see you in a little while. Well, here's a mystery for you. And it is a mystery I don't have an answer to. Why on earth is the Signala eating this tree? What on earth is so attractive about this dead tree with dried brown leaves that he's after? Isn't that fascinating? There's a green tree right next to him. And yet he's munching on not only dried leaves, but dried silver cluster leaves which have those, well, maybe there's an explanation, which has that astringent effect that sucks away all of the saliva in your mouth. We've demonstrated a couple of times before. Maybe he's got sore gums or something. I don't know. It's not the first time I've ever seen it, but it is something that I have no explanation for. I'm open to suggestions as to why you think a spectacular male bull like this gentleman, and he really is beautiful. Oh, we're going to do a bit of a horn thrash just to demonstrate how manly he is, or what would you call it? Maybe masculine, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you, Kirsty, in final control. <laughs> if masculine was the word I was looking for. And he is stunning. Definitely one of the most attractive of all of the antelope species. And interestingly enough, 
I've come through. Is he limping a little bit? He doesn't look. I'm not walking with the usual grace of the antelope. He's almost a little bit knock kneed at the back in reverse. But yes, interestingly enough, this is one of the first antelope that Brian and myself have seen while you were with James and those elephants. And I, I think, I think the reason behind that and why it's so quiet around here is I actually think it's in response to the wild dogs. Now this is the area that the wild dogs moved through early this morning and they raced all the way around here and they probably, although we weren't on this road in particular, you'd probably find that they would have come across to this side. But I guess that's why it is. I'm going to shift forward a bit. Let's see if we get another view of that gorgeous Nyala and his lady friends. Fly, please don't climb in my ear. Thank you. Darlene, while we approach our antelope, I've been giving some more thought to my favorite sounds in the bush, and I'm sort of coming, I'm starting to get to the point. Nicest view. I'm sort of starting a short list of my favorite sounds, which include, in no particular order, hyenas whooping, wild dogs calling. I'm going to then say the call of a pearl spotted owlet that. <coughs> hey, look, my lips are managing to whistle, the whistle's working again. The call of a barking gecko that you don't get here, but you do get in the Kalahari. Nice view of the Sinyala female. You can see the real color difference, particularly in this afternoon sun. So vastly different that ill-informed tourists often think that they're completely separate species, the male and the female Sinyala. And now the question becomes, what goes into my fifth and final spot of my favorite bush sounds? And I think I'm going to, oh, I nearly said something really corny. I'm not going to say it. I nearly said Brent's voice, but that's really, that's terribly tragic. <laughs> no, Brian, Brian's not enjoying it at all. <laughs> In fact, I'm surprised Brian didn't have a little gag in the back there. Um, no, we'll go with lions roaring. I will say lions roaring. When they're right next to you, it's a sound that travels through your chest and is definitely an awe-inspiring feeling, particularly at night, where you've got this instinct that tells you that you're no longer the top predator. And all of a sudden, at night time, when we lose our advantage of our sight and our bipedal stance, that makes us the apex predator of the day, thousands and thousands of years of evolution, has made us apex diurnal predators, but all of a sudden when a lion roars next to you at night, there's that little part of your ancient instincts that curls up a little bit. Not necessarily fear, because of course we can rationalize it and know that we're totally safe, but it's still an interesting. And I wonder when antelope species like these in Yala hear that call, I wonder if it fills them with that same sense of intimidation. animals and their responses to the different sounds of the bush. Bill would like to know, do animals respond to, or different animals respond to different alarm calls? How exactly do they, how does that sort of communication system within the bush, how does that play out? And Bill, it's actually an interesting one. We saw that giraffe earlier and I'm almost certain that she was listening to that squirrel. And I've seen lots and lots of creatures respond to with a squirrel or something of a similar vein. Squirrels tend to be quite alarmist. Although I suppose when you're this big fluffy and on everybody's menu, maybe it makes sense to be alarmist. But they alarm call for genets, they alarm call for snakes, for birds of prey, things that are not really a threat to the antelope species. But they also alarm call for a leopard or a lion. And so it makes sense for the antelope species to stop and listen. But when something like an impala goes, bah! 
or a nyala or a kudu barks an alarm, that is when everything goes instantly into high alert and starts to look around. And it makes total sense not to run, not to dash off because you don't know where the threat is. So if you watch antelope when they start alarm calling, particularly uh, you would have seen it with impala sightings where leopards have wandered through or lions and they shout into the distance. Um, you watch them all react and look at each other and watch where the other antelope is looking. And it doesn't, that crosses, totally crosses species boundaries. A beautiful afternoon. Look at that. of sun highlighting the afternoon awesome nice to have a little bit of cloud cover it's brought some relief to the heat of the day i still think it's not bringing us any rain though it's interesting brent and myself took a trip to hazy view to have lunch with my mom yesterday afternoon hazy view is about in a straight line probably about 80 kilometers about 40 miles away from where we are now and it was so much damper. It was so clear that they've had plenty more rain than we have had. It was greener, the seep lines were flowing, trees were flowering, flowers all over the show, greenery. And that's just, just that tiny little distance to the south and to the west of us. It was an interesting experience because you could almost see the division of where there's been more rain versus where there's been less rain within just on the ridges of the hills themselves, the one side, the lee side versus the exposed side. Interesting. It's a pity we, unfortunately, not going to get any more rain. I don't think the rain is predicted for at least another few days. Right, back to the mystery track quiz. Jilly has come fairly close. Close, but not correct, unfortunately. Suggested that, she suggested that that track that I showed you was a drag bar from some kind of device to measure distances along the road. Again, not a bad guess, although I think at this point most of the roads are mapped out on Jumo themselves and mapped through GPS technology and through mapping software. So essentially there's computers that do all kinds of measurements for us. And as long as you drive around with a GPS in your hand, you'd be able to track your distance in that way. So, close, still right, still a man-made thing. But I think I have an idea. I need a new clue. Let's think, what is a good clue? Hmm. I think the best clue I can give you is actually to take you to Ingwe Alley. Now this is a clue in itself because I'm not necessarily depending on the time because I want to get to the hyena den. I'm not necessarily going to take you along Ingwe Alley. Ingwe Alley was a two-track and a very bumpy two-track, very uncomfortable two-track to drive, but one of the roads that brought us some rich diversity of sightings. And the most notable effect of this drag device, oh, and I think I've just given it away, is on Ingwe Alley. Last, final, final clue. And I'm gonna give it a little bit of time to see if anyone gets it. And then I'm going to probably give you the answer. I'm sure there are some very frustrated people with me right now. My apologies. It's worth remembering though. It is very much worth remembering. Oh, and just to go back to Fluffy's, because Fluffy I think is the first person to catch on that I didn't say it was an animal made track suggested that it was a bike, which was a very good idea. Now the reason that it was very unlikely to have been a bike is because bikes, riding a bike in the bush is actually a phenomenally, in my opinion, personally I do know people who do it. That little deck is not going to play nicely. You got it? I'm just going to shift forward just a fraction. Look. Nope. Trying to get his view of his head. Hold on, Brian. Managing to keep up with it. As soon as you stop to look at the little antelope species, as they're feeling a bit shy, they immediately feel observed and they race off. 
Right, so why was it not a bike? And as I said, I think it's a foolish endeavor to ride a bike. It instantly triggers, and particularly with lions and with elephants, a chase response. There's something very different. I'm gonna take my hat off, because it's driving me mad. There is a distinctive difference between a person walking versus a person either riding either a bike, as in an active bike, or a motorbike. Which, by the way, the local term for is isi tu tu tu, so that's the sound it makes. I'm not going to fully emulate Scott's amazing impression of a motorbike sound. I don't think I could fully do it justice. I think he wins. But if you get my quiz right, I will imitate the sound of the device that has caused that track to be the way that it is. How's that? How's that for promises of a reward? I was talking about something. Oh, yes, I actually know somebody who used to do fence patrols. He used to work with me. It was a colleague of mine and a, a wonderful guide. And he used to, he worked his way up to being a guide from doing fence patrols along a reserve fence line. He used to drive a motorbike. And the one day he drove around a corner and there was a pride of, as we always say, you never know what's around the next corner. In his unfortunate case, it was a pride of lions all lying in the road next to the fence line. And he tried to accelerate past them. One of them actually jumped onto his back and took his backpack off, obviously aiming for him. Luckily, he was wearing that backpack, so it kept him safe. But after that particular story, I've always been a little bit wary of the idea of either bikes or motorbikes in these big five areas. Well done, Anne. Anne has got it. Anne wins the competition for today. Anne would like to know if it was a grader. This is a tricky one. It was a very, very, not horrible, but it was a, it was a tricky question. Anne, well done. It was indeed a grader. The roads have been graded and smoothed out by a tractor dragging a device behind it, which essentially is one big tractor tire and three little tires chained behind it. And it gets pulled on a chain along the road. And in this particular case, clearly, the grader had some little part that was protruding down into the road. And that's what left that long drag mark. And that's why I said we'd see it on Juma because Juma's grading the roads today. Very well done. It is pulled by a tractor, and I promised that I would imitate the sound if somebody got it right. So the local word for a tractor is gunda gunda, because it goes gunda 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 along the road. And there you go. Bravo. Well done, Anne. Now, grading a road is all part of a management strategy. I said it actually, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but it actually makes our lives a little bit easier in terms of spotting tracks and also aging tracks, because we know that today they pulled those tires across the road. And of course, makes for a more pleasant driving experience because particularly when you're racing after wild dogs, as both Brent and myself did this morning, I'm sure the cameraman will be grateful for any reduction in the bumps that they get to experience as they jolt about and clutch on madly at the back, as we do our Ferrari safaris. And for guests as well, it makes for just, especially because we're in a short Land Rover. Sorry. Okay, they've just pulled an Mbula to the south of our boundary around Chitwa, just so that you guys get that update. But yes, we're in a short wheelbase Land Rover, so we don't have, quite have that slingshot effect. But if you sit, and this is a word of advice for those of you who come on safari and maybe have slight back problems, for example, or anything like that, that maybe you want to... I thought they were going to call. They might still. Come on, Humbles. But yes, a word of advice as we look at these red bull, this pair of red bull hornbills. <laughs> One with a strange, almost bald patch around its neck. Yes, if you sit, if you have come on safari and your back slightly sore, maybe you've got knee injuries, I would suggest sitting as close as possible to the front row or in the passenger seat. And the reason behind that is it doesn't slingshot you quite as much as sitting on the back row. Of a, of a longer safari jeep might. Those of you with more 
adventurous or resilient bones might even choose to sit on the back seat because you will have an enjoyable time. I know recently poor old Viam nearly went flying off the back of the Mahindra at one point. It can be quite fun. Get slightly airborne every time you go over the bumps. But yes, my word of advice for safari goers. Watch you after little hornbill. Hopping around like a dinosaur. Digging in, oh, it looks like an ant mound. Oh, no, don't panic, don't panic, you can come back. Come on, what you after in these mounds? Interesting. Could well be after termites, of course, is definitely a possibility. Okay, well, we'll leave our feeding birds to their own devices because I do want to wander across to the hyena den. I spoke a little bit about bike riding on a reserve and the fact that I personally wouldn't do it. And that leads to a further question about whether I would go or what about horse riding within an area like this? And do we think that that is a sensible option? There are places that operate horseback safaris. They are it's an interesting thought. Personally, this is a personal opinion, and I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't do it. Personally, I find the idea quite disconcerting. The idea of riding what is essentially a prey species through the bush. But I will express an, um, that these horses are trained, and I know a few, I know a, a very good friend of mine is a horse guide. In fact, two of my friends are horse guides. Those horses are phenomenally trained, particularly the lead horses that the guide themselves ride, and the guides themselves are the most incredible, incredibly skilled equestrian, I don't know how you just experts, I suppose is the best way of putting it. I find the idea disconcerting in a big five area, particularly with lions. Lions are where the real danger happens, and I know of a few stories of people putting, um, being pulled off horseback by lions, or at least being chased. And I certainly wouldn't want to have to be sitting on a bolting, look, I'm not the world's greatest horse rider, I can ride a horse, but bolting through vegetation like this, imagine an out of control horse being chased by a lion, and you're racing through thorn trees and under stumps and over logs and around our park holes. I would much rather, and I must say, I have been on a few horseback rides in areas that are not necessarily big five, but they are wilderness areas. So there's antelope species and giraffe, and that is a truly magical experience. That is a wonderful feeling, because the animals don't recognize you as a threat. So you can walk right up to them. I've walked right up to giraffe before. Sometimes they even come and look at you out of curiosity as if to if they're wondering what this funny horse, this funny zebra is. What is this funny zebra without stripes? So personally, I would prefer not to be on a horse around in lion territory, particularly in an area such as this very high lion concentrations. There are reserves where you can go on a horseback safari in a big five, but they're slightly more closed systems. So you can they will know where the lions are and they will know where to avoid them, particularly if they're quite a highly monitored population, maybe with collars. That will help tremendously in terms of keeping the riders safe. But I've seen some extraordinary pictures and it does present you with an incredible viewing opportunity. I want to try this, but I'm not sure it's going to work. Sorry, I took a chance here, but it's already on its way. Brian, as usual, on the ball. That was an African harrier hawk flying back towards its nest on Vulture's nest. Oh, Drongo, get him. Uh-oh. <laughs> Drongos are incredible. That little black bird is fiercely mobbing. 
a terrier hawk. That's kind of what I was trying to get to show you. Anyway, it's disappeared off towards its vulture's nest. I am not towards its vulture's nest, towards vulture's nest road where its nest is. I'm going to continue on towards the hyena den. Let's find out what James has been up to. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, you find it. You don't find it. Communicate with Sorry, I thought there was a leopard on the road. It is a tree. Not a leopard at all. Not a leopard at all. Now, we've come back towards Juma, and we're hoping that the wild dogs are going to leap across the road at any stage and head on to quarantine clearings and devour some kind of hapless antelope. Not in a gory fashion, of course. Most wonderful elephant sighting I think I've... Oh, this is too good a sighting to miss. Just watch this. Look what's coming past us, everyone. That is spectacular. I think if I ever buy another car, that's how I'm going to have it painted. Anyway. Yeah, maybe pink with the spots would be very nice. So, this is the southern boundary of where we're allowed to go, of course. To the south of us is a reserve called Hoffman's, and then a little bit to that side is, in fact, this is Little Gari. This is exactly where the dogs went this morning, but they went in just beyond the drainage line that you can see there. So with any luck, we will find them coming across. Interestingly, I haven't heard any reports of them being found this afternoon. Uh, so maybe we'll be lucky. I'm gonna drive quite slowly along here and just see if some of the tracks aren't coming across. Some, all the tracks aren't coming across. It was the most fascinating sighting this morning. And when it actually took place, they disappeared into the drainage line, into the Mulawati drainage line, and Brent went around one side. Jamie was knocking about through the bush, and I went in on foot. I went down into the drainage line, and I heard them meet up with each other. And I'm not convinced, I don't know if there were one or two packs there, but the noise as it echoed through the trees in that drainage line was just fantastic. And I just, I caught the odd glimpse of the dogs. I didn't pursue it too much on foot. Just the most incredible sense, being under the trees there with that sound pinging off the leaves all around. It was just amazing. I hope you've got some sense of it on the, what was a very hectic sighting, highly exciting charge sighting that you had this morning of the dogs. So we're just going to drive very slowly along here. Lots of traffic along this road, as you can see. So we'll drive slowly along and make sure that we don't drive over the tracks. Now, we were chatting a little bit earlier about the warthogs and their concentration around water and the moving closer and closer to water. Dogs, leopards, lions, hyenas, lots of the animals will figure out what these anim what the, the prey species are going to do. They know somehow, well, probably because of the movement of the animals towards the water, that they need to concentrate themselves around the water. And whilst the sun coming out, it was Andrew turning up so that you can see my pet by team. Thank you, Andrew. And overhead, the politician crowds gather again. They have just about the whole week these grey clouds have come over and failed to deliver anything, which is very appropriate in address, in address of a notable president. Much like those of the clouds. Sorry about that, everyone. Right, this is around about where the dogs crossed this morning. Just over there on Leadwood Road. Now the other pack, the Investec pack, was found on the northern reaches of Biffles Hook at the boundary with the Mandaleti. That's why I'm just not convinced that we had two packs here. That's quite a little
Rusty's aerial bike not be as firmly attached as we think it is. It seems as though we're getting a couple of black screens and loss of signals. That is, of course, part and parcel of bringing you these safaris live from the bush. So that you do have these moments that occur every now and again. But I'm sure you'll be up and running shortly as he makes his way back from Arethusa and on to Juma. I'm going to make my way along quarantine and up towards the hyena den. Before I get there, I want to just pop my nose into Gallego Pan. I checked it earlier today, but there were only buffalo males. I wouldn't be surprised though, maybe those elephants that we were watching earlier might have decided to come down here for a drink. The rest of the herd were moving in that general direction. What I can do, since you're now on the back of my vehicle anyway, is just have a look and see if I can see the grader itself. Since that has occupied our conversation for this afternoon, and this whole road, by the way, has been dragged, it's just that now the tracks have been driven over again. But I'm right here, so let me, bless you, bless you, Brian. My goodness, it's the dust, I tell you. Let me just see if this grader's in its usual place. I can show you. We get a bit of a behind the scenes tour before I race off to the hyena den. Mm, usually the leaves here. Let's just check around the corner. There we go. It is here. And in fact, it's tracks. I'm all the way. We've tracked down our, our <laughs> perpetrator of that track. <laughs> Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Our best sighting, <laughs> the road grader. And you can see probably where it's a slightly different design to the one that I described, but it's still exactly the same function. Those two tires then drag along. The pole, I think, is, I'm not entirely sure why that pole's there. It must be an extra support structure. Might have been responsible for our drag track, you never know. In fact, maybe it was. So there you are. We've tracked down our mysterious animal that left the track and it's settled down in its sleeping patch for the evening, ready for a new day of work tomorrow morning, grading the eastern half of Juma. time is something that Zumi Mike in Michigan would like to know about. And he's saying, is the Gauri gang apparently a troop of baboons? Are they around? Because they haven't been seen in a while. Mike, I haven't personally, I've seen a baboon troop once while I've been working at Juma, which is since July last year. I have honestly not seen baboons all that frequently at all. It was one sighting. They went from the Juma pan, they came and had a drink at the swimming pool at Ingers, which is where I live, and they moved off again. And that has been my one and only baboon sighting to date while I've been here. It's actually been quite extraordinary. I, I would suggest that because of the drought, they've moved more towards the river iron areas. That's possibly where they've disappeared off to. Maybe some of the bigger forested areas up towards in Bithel, so not necessarily forested, but a little bit more access to water. That would be my only suggestion as to an explanation for the absence of apparently what is called the Gauri Gag. I have to be honest to me, Mike, I had no idea they were nicknamed that. So I've learned something new today. Next time I see a baboon troop, I will know that it's the Gauri Gag. Quite a tiny lamb. Morning or afternoon. That little one on the left is still quite small. Oh, must have been a late birth. There you go, responding not in this particular case to alarm calls, <coughs> but responding to the sudden motion of the rest of the herd. So as soon as one impala starts to run, the others either start to panic along with it and run with it, or they at least look in the direction to see why it's running. It's an important survival trait, that constant vigilance. You can't really afford to assume anything out here. 
You can't really afford to assume that anything is a false alarm. Especially for Impala that are pretty much on everybody's menu. From wild dogs to hyena to leopards to lions. The most, being the most numerous species of antelope automatically becomes you, means that you become the most eaten. Very young Impala lambs. But that is fairly typical. You do get a late birth around February. Basically, all of the ewes that didn't fall pregnant with the first mating in May then start to give... They, there's a second rut about a month and a half later, and that's what leads to the later births. Spindly little creatures. What a difference a year's growth makes. And Paula, apart from being incredibly fastidious, are fortunate in the antelope species that they can, are pretty much mixed feeders. <laughs> Look at the curiosity there. That is a, a lamb from this year's birth, and the sub-adult with those horns is from last year's birth, last year's Impala lambs. You can see how much growth occurs in a year. Long way to go, little one. Where was I? Oh, yes. So I was chatting a bit about impalas being mixed feeders. So they feed both on grass and on leaves. But Reed was wondering, in these dry seasons, what plants are there to keep the animals well fed? And the answer is mainly trees. The trees are what sustain most of the life out here. They've got access to a little bit more water. I'm going to go forward a little bit so we can get a nice view while we answer this. Some of the grass species, particularly the perennial species, will still have nutrition to be found, maybe in the roots of the trees themselves. What are you looking at, Impala? What have you seen? Apart from me, of course. Hello. So, Reed, yes, the, the, some of the perennial grasses will have root systems that still contain nutrition. There'll be bulbs that the animals can dig up. And then for animals like impala and elephants, which feed on both grass and leaves, you'll find that they generally target the trees more frequently than they do the grasses. Quite often nibbling around stumps such as this one, which might contain, might shelter the other plant species a little bit better stop them from losing as much moisture. The animals will move closer to the rivers and to seep lines where there's a bit more underground water that they can, that will provide the plants with more nutrients. And other than that, it's one struggle for survival. The animals that are going to suffer the most are the bulk grazers, animals that eat mainly grass. So the zebras, the wildebeest, the buffalo, especially with their huge herds, giant herds at times, according to James, as he described them this morning. But those are the animals that are probably going to struggle the most in terms of being resilient throughout this drought period. But it's amazing how much nutrition the ruminants can get out of their food, which is why being a ruminant, like these in Pala, is such a good idea. Four stomachs means plenty of intense digestion happening. I'm just going to give you one last view of a beautiful antelope. I also wanted to just check what they were all looking at in this direction. There's nothing. And I think it's time for us to move on. James is racing back to the DRC, which is the camp that we operate out of, in order to get Rusty seen to and checked out. Okie dokie, let's go to the hyena den before it gets a bit too dark and a bit too late. Find out what those scoundrels have been up to. Oh, it's an interesting question while I head across to the hyena den site. Lorraine was wondering if I've checked any of the other empty ones, so the older ones that have been used in the past. And Lorraine, I always do, periodically I do go and check those hyena dens. The other thing that I do is I check the access roads to and from them. Pretty much
much every time I drive past them to see if there's tracks of hyenas going up and down. With an active den site, almost inevitably, they use the roads. The hyenas are particularly good at this. They use the roads that human beings have made. It's a nice, easy way for them to go backwards and forwards from the entrance. And hyena dens are almost always, their presence is given away by repeated hyena tracks moving around a certain area over a couple of days. So I always check the rain. I have so far not encountered any other active den sites. That doesn't mean that there aren't any though. The only one I haven't checked is the one that I found on Aubrey's Road months ago. And I haven't been across because that was a very particular site with a couple of different active dens within a very small area. It was back when the February twins and Bella and June were around and still sort of den bound, I suppose would be the best way to put it. They were constantly around the den site. And this morning, those little sub-adults, and I'm not sure exactly which sub-adults it was, I'm fairly certain I saw at least one of the February twins this morning, but they were playing a very dangerous game, curiously following the wild dogs, which of course they do. They're clever scavengers and they know an opportunity when they see one, but they definitely were chancing it, being as close at times as they were to those wild dogs. Luckily they know when to run off, and most of the time, We've often talked about that predator, hi predator hierarchy, but for both of those species, uh, wild dogs and hyenas included, and in fact most animals, would prefer to avoid a serious physical confrontation. So that sighting with Scott that was extraordinary, where the wild dogs were attacking that individual hyena, that's a fairly common occurrence, and most of the time, the wild dogs will release the hyena without killing it. They do occasionally kill each other, as all predators can and are capable of doing. Anything? Nope. Just one buffalo ball. Two buffalo balls. Good evening, gentlemen. Brief stop. I'm not even going to switch off my engine, I don't think. I will. Just for a brief view of this buffalo bull ruminating in Gallego pan. Hello, oh boy. Keeping cool in the late afternoon heat. It certainly, despite the cloud cover, doesn't feel as though the temperature has dropped very much, although at least we're not in the blazing direct sunlight. Settling down for the evening. <laughs> And one of the buffalo, sorry, in front of us has actually found a really nice pillow for his late afternoon nap, resting his head on the log. Look how comfy that looks. Fast asleep in dream world. You gotta make use of the best pillows available. during this drought season, particularly, for example, the buffalo who are going to, as we continue throughout these, going into our dry season, not that our wet season has been particularly damp. But cat is correct. I found a big log. Sorry, Brian. To me, to try and catapult you off the back there. Brian, however, is well practiced in dealing with our driving idiosyncrasies. Right, so, Kat, Kat has said, although it is upsetting to see, we believe that these droughts are part of nature within Africa, and it is a way of separating the strong from the weak, and in that sense, you are absolutely correct. Ultimately, this drought is, could well do a favor for the surviving animals. The strongest ones are going to survive, it selects for the strongest genetic pools, and it, it is, a, it is as harsh as it sounds, it's a cycle that's been repeating itself for hundreds and hundreds of years. And 
probably within, for example, that elephant cow that we saw earlier, within her lifetime, she will have seen at least three or four of these long, dry spells. And the animals of the Kruger have got such a vast, open space to move around in. I think for them, it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. The ecosystem will recover, it will bounce back almost immediately. Yes, a lot, of, a lot of people are saying that this drought for the Kruger is not a bad thing. There is, I mean, there's, there's a different argument, and that is the fact that for the farmers of South Africa, it is a different matter. And to that extent, as human beings, that we have shaped the nature of the water table throughout the country, not necessarily within the Kruger, but throughout the country, by building dams, irrigating crops, all part of our necessary survival and impact that we have on the world around us. But without the rain, times are going to be tough, for example, for farmers. But the animals in Kruger and where we are at the, mo at the moment, we're fortunate enough to be in a situation where there's enough space, enough wilderness area without fences that the animals can actually recover and bounce back. And the awesome thing is that by watching these live drives, you're not just coming for a visit for two or three days or four days or two weeks. You're coming to visit for years. And you'll be able to observe the changes, which is one of the things I love, getting the information from our regular viewers who've been watching for such extended periods of time. You'll see the landscape being shaped. You'll be able to compare your screenshots. I know many of you have sent through screenshots of, it, of just what the Boyatella Dam looked like this time last year right up to the lodge itself. It's all part of a long and interesting pattern. And one which, unfortunately, we just have absolutely no control over. Luckily, as Fad says, it is part of nature and not all doom and gloom.
the water flow, so it makes fall. That's why we've got those bumps as well in the road. Those bolsters are not to stop us from speeding after wild dogs. It's actually to stop water flowing down the road and drawing water out from the underground water table on either side of the road. So each of those bumps, those little bolsters, has a drain that has been dug, attached on either side, that redirects the water off to where it needs to be. out this afternoon. Interesting. Not surprised by this. Where's your mummies? You two? Two little mischiefs. Three little mischiefs. No sign of any adult supervision. Ooh, while the adults are away. The hyena cubs have got brave, but they're actually out. As they are, there must be an adult somewhere around me. It's very seldom that you get to see them scampering about like this without the safe supervision of an adult. Well, they could be getting to that stage where they feel old enough and brave enough to do so. Hello, you little monsters. That's, that doesn't look very edible. In fact, I'm fairly certain that's a clump of, is that a clump of elephant dung? Oh well, any toy in a, when you're bored. You've got November and the December twins out. down. Let's see if I can, if they'll let me get a little bit closer. I just want to investigate why there's pubs out without an adult. It doesn't often happen that way. Hello, mischiefs. I'm glad that the cubs are out for all of us to be able to see them. Out and unsupervised. Oh, and still almost as clumsy as when they first emerged before their spots appeared and they were wobbling their way around the Galago shortcut den. And for them, this drought is the only weather that they know. And summer is the only time that they know, but of course, Inevitably, the seasons will start to change. And Zoe, you're wondering if I've noticed any signs of fall, or as we call it, autumn, and whether we've seen any behavioral changes. I must say, I wouldn't say I've seen signs of fall, but the leaves are starting to change far sooner than they should. <laughs> Get this one having a good chew at the stick. Just like that little baby monkey did at the start of drive, keeping themselves entertained. That little cub on the right that I think might be November. Quite a stocky individual back in the den. But Zoe, sorry, to get back to your answer, the leaves have started to change, but that's more of a factor of the drought, I think, than anything else. They've become very droopy definitely have lost their colors far sooner than we usually would see. Usually we only see signs of autumn starting to hit home around April and the beginning of May. But this dry season has pretty much changed everything and turned it all topsy-turvy. I wonder where these adult hyenas are and what they're up to. I wonder if they've got a carcass somewhere that they're scavenging off. Could be. We are very fortunate to be able to see these cubs out without the adults and watch them stumble around and play around. And Deborah's absolutely right. Their paws are probably the most disproportionate part of them, just like puppy dogs. When you have a look at their feet, they always look out of proportion and too large for their bodies. 
and like they might fall over their own feet at some point. There's that wasp, that spider hunting wasp. It shot into view on your screens. I know that one of the viewers asked about it a couple of weeks ago. They kept hearing the buzzing sound around our heads and around our microphones. And we're wondering what that was, if it was a drone or what was causing that sound. And it is the spider hunting wasp that seems to share the, or really enjoy this hyena den site. I've seen it every time that I've come here. So keep your eye out for the black flash that might shoot across your screen. But Deborah, absolutely, those enormous paws are good fun to observe. It's one of the... Some sad and sorry news from poor old Rusty, which always seems to time itself around almost the start of the weekend. I believe tomorrow is Friday, unless I've got my days mixed up. Well, big feet in the air. Here we go. Look there, you can see the white toes. <laughs> One of the December twins. So, guys, this Rusty is broken and will need some slightly more serious attention than we originally thought, so she won't be out. James is setting up bushwalk, although he probably won't be walking at this point, but he might be on the back of the Mahindra for the last few moments of our sunset safari. But for now, we've got some cub action, and I want to just stick around a little bit longer around the hyena den, just to see if maybe some of the adults decide to return. So now's your opportunity to ask about the fascinating creatures that are spotted. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> You're sitting on me. You can just imagine the sibling fights that these two have. Ha, showed him off. So yes, if you've got questions about the fascinating creatures that are spotted hyenas, send them through to us now. We can have a long chat about one of my favorite predators. It's interesting. This, I think, is one of the first times where I haven't seen the adults around. And the fact that they're out and unsupervised, Sergei was wondering, what are the dangers that they might be faced with? And there's a couple of them. Um, although I think at this age, and staying as close to the den entrance as they have been, they're probably relatively safe. But any leopard that wanders through, or a lion, or even a wild dog, I suppose would be a possibility. It has happened here before, as many of our regular viewers will know. Let me back up ever so slightly so that we don't have leaves in our way. So, Sergei, those would be the main threats. And if those cubs were caught by surprise, they could well be facing a very dire threat in those kinds of situations. Yes, you too. I'm talking about you. However, as long as they manage to retreat to the safety of the den, it's unlikely that they will be dug out. Now, we've spoken before about the way that the den is structured and the amazing ability of hyena cubs to excavate their own tunnels. So they can excavate tiny little tunnels that they can travel through and that are small enough to accommodate, or big enough to accommodate them, but too small to allow even a sub-adult hyena to wander through. So as long as the cubs are safe in those tunnels themselves, there's not much that can get them. Leopard might try, and sometimes sub-adult lions in particular, for some reason, particularly sub-adult male lions, might have a go at digging them out. And of course, we all know about Tingana and his amazing ability with jumping into, into animals' burrows and den sites. He managed to catch that baby, baby warthog on Big Cat Week last year. And while I wait to see if the adults decide to return to their troublesome youngsters, James is out on quarantine. Let's find out about his afternoon. Three. Right, everybody, I'm afraid Rusty is no longer. The aerial came loose, possibly as a result of some very exciting times this morning and yesterday morning with the wild dogs. Watch the whole Andrew. So we've just come onto quarantine clearings. That was a, 
odontotermes hole that Andrew nearly fell into. Just for a brief stroll, we're not going to be walking far. We're just standing on quarantine, seeing the lay of the land here. We'll probably go and pop on that termite mound there and give you a view of the politician clouds that are masking the sunset, which I'm sure in some parts of the world is very spectacular as we speak. But over here, as I said, as we were driving along earlier along, um, earlier on, these clouds have kind of come up every evening. There's been distant thunder rolls every so often, and the sunset has been covered by them. And they've done nothing other than kind of ruin the sunset, really. They have delivered nothing in the way of moisture. It's still quite muggy. The air is close. Here comes some wildebeest, Andrew. Let's watch them. You see it there? They're obviously coming out. They're coming out onto the clearings, I think, in an attempt to sort of find a spot for the night where they can see anything that might want to come and eat them. He's definitely seen us. But he's just, yeah, he's alarm calling. He's going, whoo, whoo. Now, the best thing we can do here, of course, is not behave like a predator. And by sitting down here, I've done precisely that. That's exactly what a leopard would have done. And have walked up here, and if it was interested in hunting, it would have just hidden itself behind that thing, that sort of part of the mound, lifted its head up and looked over, flattened its little ears and looked up to wilds where the wildebeest was coming. But I think the wilde is not too nervous of us because Andrew is obviously walking around, and so it knows that he's not behaving like a predator at all. Let's walk very gently and slowly into this clearing and we'll see how close he'll let us get. I don't think it'll be very close. There's the wildebeest and there's an impala running past, frolicking about in the new kulth that comes as the summer sun sets. Eric, you're in Virginia Beach, of course you are. Where else would you be unless you were on holiday? And you want to know, I use the term bush felt. What did I mean by bush felt and what are the different kinds of felt? Felt essentially means land, Eric, and it's an Afrikaans term. And so when we say the felt, we basically mean nature. We mean the wilderness, if you like. And so bush felt, I suppose, would be an area like this, what we'd describe as woodland, Cumbretum woodland. It's, it's traditionally used to refer to this low felt area. So it's not a it's not a particularly good biological term and it wouldn't be used by a biologist or an ecologist to describe a vegetation type. Bush felt is just kind of the area in the low felt here where game occurs. Up on the high felt, yeah, I suppose you might call it bush felt, but it's more likely that you'd call it the bush for some reason. And that also can refer to any kind of wilderness. They do the same thing in Australia. They call the wilderness there the bush. I say it with a slightly more nasal twang than I say it, don't they, Andrew? Right, Ra Wildebeest is over there. He's just walking past what used to be a fairly clear area, but has been inundated now with silver cluster leaf trees, seedless saplings. And let's go, we can walk over and have a look at them. This is not going to be a long bush walk, everyone. Obviously, the light is fading. And for the same reason that the wildebeest is coming out onto the clearing, we will be heading home fairly soon. And that, of course, is to avoid being noshed by a nocturnal predator. For being noshed by a nocturnal predator would be a very foul end to the day, wouldn't you say, Andrew? Because it has been quite a pleasant day. In fact, it's been a very pleasant day. And what is quite nice here, um, oh, no, it isn't. Sorry, I thought we had both microphones on. I, we were going to try, I was going to try and have both microphones on this thing so that although you can hear my voice here, you'd also get some ambient sound, but we haven't managed to do that. Right, so here are these saplings that uh, we are in amongst now. And you can see they've come out of, the, they've come out of this clearing as a function because of the fact that the grass is so sparse and so there is nothing competing 
with the grass roots, at least with the, with the sapling roots. So normally what would happen here is that the grass in a normal year would outcompete any of the tree saplings and seedlings because their roots are tap roots and they don't grow very fast at the beginning. But now in the absence of the grass, you can see there's lots of sand around. In the absence of the grass, there's no competition for the saplings. They've put down their roots and they are growing with a great enthusiasm. And if this is not to be a thicket fairly soon, something will have to be. Right, the last thing I'm going to show you this evening is this beautiful grass called Heteropogon contortus. And it is called contortus. I have no idea why it's called Heteropogon, but because of these orms, orms. There's the seed. The seed is on the end there. That is the seed there. And what it does, if you'll excuse me, when it rains, I don't know if you can see it moving, but it turns around. Can you see it twisting? It's twisting slightly. Normally when it rains, it would twist around. You can see it twisting, and what that does is it burrows the seed into the ground. Isn't that brilliant? So clever is nature. Okay. I think that's probably all we have to show you now. So let's go back to Jamie. I don't know if you will see me again tonight. I think probably not. But thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for holding your breath during that incredible elephant sighting that we had. Thank you, Andrew, for your uh, movement this afternoon. Well done. And um, big thank you to the final control. We'll hand you back to Jamie and Brian. And I'll see you in the morning at 05.30. See you later. And adult supervision has arrived in what looks like the form of Corky. He's come in, called the cubs back out of the den. They were hiding in the den while you were with James. She's come and called them out and is now thoroughly going about a good wash for the cubs themselves. And we've spoken before about why that's important in terms of hygiene for these little creatures that could well go down into the entrance to the den and then defecate and urinate just generally get covered in all kinds of muck hello girl is that it were you just coming to check that's interesting i thought that she would at least settle down to feed Cubs frantically following on. What's up, guys? Are you feeling brave now? Hello? Oh, you're getting so curious. Look at you, you little monster. And one final straggler also coming in. Look how close they're coming. That's <laughs> so awesome. So brave, you lot. Look at your courage. Don't chew my oil cap, you little monkeys. Yes, you. I'm talking to you. I just have to actually take my earpiece out for a second. I don't want to loom over them and frighten them, but I want to just check up on what's going on. Yes, because I don't trust you one little bit looking at me with those innocent eyes. I know better. There's no innocence there. You're checking out Brian. <laughs> Brian, you've got some new friends. Awesome. Unfortunately, I can't reposition to show you her. So we'll have to look at the back, or through the back around the antenna because otherwise I'll scare her cubs away. How awesome is that? Darlene? talking about my favorite sounds. 
How ghostly was that? That sounded like a howl. Awesome. I wonder if these cubs ever stop and think, I, I hope, I'm looking forward to the day when I'm big and I can make that sound. Not quite there yet, little cubs, although November has done a very passable impression of a hyena trying to whoop. Just to let you know, if you are sending through questions, every now and again my communication system is cutting out. But Donna, I did get your question through about at what age the hyena cubs will start to go hunting and move about with the adults. And actually, Donna, fascinatingly enough, it depends on the rank of the cubs themselves. The higher ranking cubs will stay at the den longer because the adults will bring them food. The higher ranking females will be able to drag food back to the den. The lower ranking females less so, and so they have to take their cubs with them at an earlier age. <laughs> they are absolutely irresistible. We need a name for the trio, the December and the November trio. The December twins in November, close in age, and the three of them are just pure trouble on legs. Twelve legs of mischief Ooh, and very large feet. Donna, the earliest will be around six months old, six to about eight months old, that the cubs will start going with their mothers and go out foraging. We saw it quite early with June, actually, that she was wandering about with her mom and going to carcasses. We're looking, yes, at about six to eight months. They start munching on solid food, depending on, again, on their rank, but they will start eating meat for at about six months of age. That being said, they will not, their mothers will not stop lactating, so they'll still be suckling for at least a year, right up to a year and a half. Very extended period of lactation for spotted hyenas. One of the, it's one of the explanations behind the idea of why the females are bigger and stronger with such high testosterone levels. It's a very interesting one. It's called the big mother theory. The bigger the mother, the better her milk production capabilities are going to be. It was interesting that Corky came in and called and gave the cub a quick bath before moving off. But we did get to get a really nice view of her and that sound is definitely within my top five of the sounds that you can hear in the bush. Sergey was wondering why do they put their heads down? when they call. And the answer to that, Sergey, is it, and I've been looking into this out of curiosity because it's one of the questions that's been raised before by viewers, and I haven't really been able to give a specific answer. I mean, a cub head disappeared into the den. All three have gone, retreated to the safety of the burrow. They seem to know instinctively that it's getting dark and that unless the parents are around, this is a dangerous spot to be in. Sergey, they call with their heads down like that for two reasons. One of the explanations that's been put forward is one that I'm not entirely sure I buy into, and that's that it bounces off the ground and then echoes away. I have my doubts about that because the ground will also absorb some of it. I don't know, it's valid theory, entirely valid theorem. And the other one is that it's the way that their larynx is structured. So in order, by pulling their neck down, they're able to pull the larynx down towards the chest cavity and deepen the sound and expand the resonating area within the throat itself so it expands that volume it's all physiologically connected it's often one i know that it's also one of the theories why lions often call lying down because in theory the vibrations travel further and the ground bounces it back up and it echoes i'm still not entirely sure how i feel about the physics of that but it is one of the theories is that it bounces down and actually travels further in that way i'm going to leave the hyena den now since the cubs have gone to bed, it is getting dark, and as we've mentioned before, the spotlight does, is not to be put on these little cubs. Just bear with me one second. I'm just going to give my earpiece a little bit of a jiggle just to see that it's working correctly, and I'm just going to test it quickly. Right, so as long as I drive with my right hand on the earpiece itself, on the earpiece connection, we should be absolutely fine. Good thing I don't need both hands to drive. Apparently, there's 
a couple of hyenas of the Juma Pan. So I'm going to head across in that direction and see if we can't have a look at them. Time before the end of the sunset safari. She only stopped by for the briefest of visits with her cubs before moving on. on a diurnal animal or a daytime animal without compromising their ability to see in the dark. So although it certainly doesn't blind them, it does detract from their ability and therefore makes them more vulnerable to predators. So it's just good guiding ethics not to prolong any light exposure on an animal that operates during the day. Anything from a cheetah to a wild dog to the Inyan and Impala that we see around here and even the buffalo when we drive past them. Let's see. I don't think in the time frame that we've got left that we're going to get across to those hyena at the Juma Dam Pan. So you'll just have to keep me updated as to what they happen to get up to at some point during the evening. And keep your eye on that pan because as this drought continues, more and more animals are going to be wandering through to go and have a drink. And who knows who might be the nocturnal visitors this evening? Could be anything. I'm waiting for the day when you spot a serval or a honey badger or something like that. Those are always the most exciting reports to receive first thing in the morning. And that sable that made the once-off mystery appearance, first time in 17 years that a sable antelope has been seen on the Juma Dam camera itself. That was definitely a unique sighting, but let's see if that sable returns at some point. Drought may well bring it back and again and again towards the Juma Pan. After the frantic pace of this morning, I've actually really, truly enjoyed, I think, a more relaxed tone to this afternoon's drive. Lovely elephants wandering about and that wonderful monkey sighting, which I think goes down as the highlight of the drive for me. And just towards the end, Darlene, this smell, this African evening smell, it's not as pronounced as it is in the rainy season, but there's an indescribable scent. It's, it's dust and earth and something that I just can only describe as typically African. I couldn't specifically tell you what it is. That is, I think, one of my top favorite smells of all time in the bush. Brian, have you come up with a favorite sound yet? There are just too many. Brian, of course, being far better at his imitations than I could ever hope to be. And so we wait until the morning. Sorry, guys. One last question that's come through before the end of our sunset safari is from Christopher in Arizona. Christopher would like to know which animal would I consider to be the most beautiful in the African bush? Oh, Christopher, that's another really difficult question. Leopards are, of course, perfection in motion. Cheetah are stunning. The wild dogs. There was one individual in that wild dog pack this morning with lots of white on her. 
and just the most incredible, like somebody had splattered paint on them. There's some phenomenal birds, Christopher, I'm not even sure I could honestly choose. I'd have to take categories. I'd have to have best looking categories because that's an impossible question for me to answer. I'm not sure. I'm sure everybody will agree that leopards are definitely one of the most aesthetically pleasing creatures. But it's not just them. And that vast array of bird life that we get, the, even the woodlands kingfishers that we sort of take for granted, or the carmine bee eaters with their phenomenal coloration. No, impossible. That's definitely impossible to choose. Servals are gorgeous, caracals are beautiful. Got to be careful of overusing the word pretty and gorgeous and beautiful. I think I need to find some more adjectives to utilize. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have drawn to the end of our, come to the end of our drive. A big thank you to Brian for all of his fantastic camera work, as well as to Kirsty and Jerry and Fine and Control and James and Andrew out on the Brasky Bushwalk combination. And of always, a big thank you to you, the viewers. Join us tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari. Have a fantastic evening. Cheers.